Welcome to Sleep Scribe, your one-stop destination for audiobooks, sleep stories, and relaxing background music. At Sleep Scribe, we believe in the power of sound to relax de-stress and improve sleep. Our extensive library of high-quality audio content is carefully curated to help you unwind, fall asleep faster, and sleep more soundly. Whether you're looking for soothing sounds of nature, calming audiobooks, we have something for everyone. My name is Iris. Today, we are excited to present to you the audiobook of The Sword in the Stone, a classic tale by T.H. White. Ward, an orphan boy, becomes the future King Arthur when he pulls the legendary sword from the stone. Guided by the humorous wizard Merlin, Ward embarks on a wondrous journey, learning bravery and leadership. The Sword in the Stone is a whimsical coming-of-age story filled with magic, humor, and historical elements. Join Ward on his extraordinary quest to become the legendary King Arthur. So why not take a deep breath, hit subscribe, and let Sleepscribe take you on a journey of relaxation and tranquility? Chapter 1. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays it was court hand and summuli logicales, while the rest of the week it was the organ and repetition and astrology. The governess was always getting muddled with her astrolabe, and when she got specially muddled, she would take it out on the wart by wrapping his knuckles. She did not wrap Kay's knuckles because when Kay grew older, he would be Sir Kay, and the master of the estate. The wart was called the wart because it rhymed with art, which was short for his real name. Kay had given him the nickname. Kay was not called anything but Kay, because he was too dignified to have a nickname, and would have flown into a passion if anybody had tried to give him one. The governess had red hair and some mysterious wound from which she derived a lot of prestige by showing it to all the women of the castle, behind closed doors. It was believed to be where she sat down and to have been caused by sitting on a broken bottle at a picnic by mistake. Eventually she offered to show it to Sir Ector, who was Kay's father, had hysterics and was sent away. They found out afterwards that she had been in a lunatic hospital for three years. In the afternoons the program was Mondays and Fridays tilting and horsemanship Tuesdays, hawking, Wednesdays fencing, Thursdays archery, Saturdays the theory of chivalry with the proper measures to be blown on all occasions terminology of the chase and hunting etiquette. If you did the wrong thing at the mortar the undoing, for instance, you were bent over the body of the dead beast and smacked with the flat side of a sword. This was called being bladed. It was horseplay, a sort of joke like being shaved when crossing the line. Kay was not bladed, although he often went wrong. After they had got rid of the governess, Sir Ector said, after all, damn it all, we can't have the boys running about all day like hooligans, after all, can we, damn it all, ought to be having a first-rate education, at their age. When I was their age I was doing all this Latin and stuff at 5 o'clock every morning. Happiest time of my life, past the port. Sir Grummore Grummersum, who was staying the night because he had been benighted out questing after a specially long run, said that when he was their age, he was swished every morning, because he would go hawking instead of learning. He attributed to this weakness the fact that he could never get beyond the future simple of uter. It was a third of the way down the left-hand page, he said. He thought it was page 97. He passed the port. Sir Ector said, had a good quest today? Sir Grummore said, oh, not so bad. Rattling good day, in fact found a chap called Sir Bruce Sans Pike chop pin off a maiden's head in weed and bushes, ran him to Mixberry Plantation in the Bysayer, where he doubled back and lost him in Wiccan Wood. Must have been a good 25 miles as he ran, a straight-necked unsaid Sir Ector. 
but about these boys and all this Latin and that added Sir Ector, Amo, Amas, you know, and running about like hooligans, what would you advise? I said Sir Grummore, laying his finger by his nose and winking at the port, that takes a deal of thinking about, if you don't mind my saying so. Don't mind at all said Sir Ector, very kind of you to say anything, much obliged, I'm sure, help yourself to port. Good port this said Sir Grummore, get it from a friend of mine said Sir Ector. But about these boys said Sir Grummore, how many of them are there, do you know? Two said Sir Ector counting them both, that is, couldn't send them to Eton, I suppose, inquired Sir Grummore cautiously, long way and all that, we know, isn't so much the distance said Sir Ector, but that giant what's his name is in the way, have to pass through his country, you understand, what is his name? can't recollect it at the moment, not for the life of me, fellow that lives by the burbly water. Ah, Galapas said Sir Grummore, that's the very chap. The only other thing said Sir Grummore is to have a tutor. You mean a fellow who teaches you said Sir Ector wisely. That's it said Sir Grummore, a tutor you know, a fellow who teaches you. Have some more port said Sir Ector, you need it after all this question. Splendid day said Sir Grummore, only they never seem to kill nowadays. Run 25 miles and then mark to ground or lose him altogether. The worst is when you start a fresh quest. We kill all our giants cubbins said Sir Ector. After that they give you a fine run, but get away. Run out of scent said Sir Grummore. I dare say, it's always the same with these big giants in a big country, they run out of scent. But even if you were to have a tutor said Sir Ector, I don't see how you would get in. Advertise said Sir Grummore. I have advertised said Sir Ector. I put it in the Hummerland News and Cardoyle Advertiser. The only other way said Sir Grummore is to start a quest. You mean a quest for a tutor explained Sir Ector. That's it said Sir Grummore. Hick, hack, hawk said Sir Ector. Have some more port. Hunk said Sir Grummore. So it was decided. When Sir Grummore Grummersome had gone away next day, Sir Ector tied a knot in his handkerchief to remember to start a quest for a tutor as soon as he had time, and as he was not quite sure how to set about it, he told the boys what Sir Grummore had suggested and warned them not to be hooligans meanwhile, then they went haymaking. It was July, and every able-bodied man and woman on the estate worked all that month in the field, under Sir Ector's direction. In any case the boys would have been excused from being educated just then. Sir Ector's castle stood in an enormous clearing in a still more enormous forest. It had a big green courtyard and a moat with pike in it. The moat was crossed by a strongly fortified stone bridge which ended halfway across it. The other half was covered by a wooden drawbridge which was wound up every night. As soon as you had crossed the drawbridge you were at the top of the village street. It had only one street, and this extended for about half a mile with little white thatched houses of mud on either side of it. The street divided the clearing into two huge fields, that on the left being cultivated in hundreds of long narrow strips, while that on the right ran down to a little river and was used as pasture. Half of the right-hand field was fenced off for hay. It was July, and real July weather, such as they only had in Old England. Everybody went bright brown like Red Indians with startling teeth and flashing eyes. The dogs moved about with their tongues hanging out, or lay panting in bits of shade, while the farm horses sweated through their coats and flicked their tails, and tried to kick the horseflies off their bellies with their great hind hoofs. In the pasture field the cows were on the gad, and could be seen galloping about with their tails in the air, which made Sir Ector angry. Sir Ector stood on the top of a rick, whence he could see what everybody was doing, and shouted commands all over the 200-acre field, and grew purple in the face. The best mowers mowed away in a line where the grass was still uncut. 
their scythes roaring all together in the strong sunlight. The women raked the dry hay together in long lines with wooden rakes and two boys with pitchforks followed up on either side of the line turning the hay inwards so that it lay well for picking up. Then the great carts followed rumbling with their spiked wooden wheels and drawn by horses or slow white oxen. One man stood on top of the cart to receive the hay in direct operations, while one man walked on either side picking up what the boys had prepared and throwing it to him with a fork. The cart was led down the lane between two lines of hay and was loaded in strict rotation from the front poles to the back, the man on top calling out in a stern voice where he wanted each fork to be pitched. The loaders grumbled at the boys for not having laid the hay properly and threatened to tan them when they caught them if they got left behind. When the wagon was loaded, it was drawn to Sir Ector's rick and pitched to him. It came up easily because it had been loaded systematically not like modern hay, and Sir Ector scrambled about on top, getting in the way of the two assistants, who did all the real work and stamping and perspiring and scratching about with his fork and trying to make the rick grow straight and shouting that it would all fall down as soon as the west winds came. The wart loved haymaking and was good at it, Kay, who was two years older, generally stood on the edge of the bundle of hay which he was trying to pick up, with the result that he worked twice as hard as the wart for only half the result. But he hated to be beaten by anybody at anything, and used to fight away with the wretched hay which he loathed like poison, until he was quite sick. The day after Sir Grumnor's visit was hot sweltering for the men who toiled from milking to milking, and then again till sunset in their battle with the sultry element, for the hay was an element to them, like sea or air in which they bathed and plunged themselves, and which they even breathed in. The seeds and small scraps stuck in their hair, their mouths, their nostrils, and worked tickling inside their clothes. They did not wear many clothes, and the shadows between their sliding muscles were blue on the nut-brown skins. Those who feared thunder had felt ill that morning. In the afternoon a terrible storm came. Sir Ector kept them at it till the great flashes were right overhead and then, with the sky as dark as night, the rain came hurling against them, so that they were drenched at once and could not see a hundred yards. The boys lay crouched under the wagons wrapped in hay to keep their wet bodies warm against the now cold wind and all joked with one another while heaven fell. Kay was shivering, though not with cold but he joked like the others because he would not show he was afraid. At the last and greatest thunderbolt every man startled involuntarily, and each saw the other startle until they all laughed away their shame. But that was the end of the haymaking for them and the beginning of play. The boys were sent home to change their clothes. The old dame who had been their nurse fetched dry jerkins out of a press and scolded them for catching their deaths and denounced Sir Ector for keeping them on so long. Then they slipped their heads into the laundered shirts and ran out into the refreshed and sparkling court. I vote we take Cully and see if we can get some rabbits in the chase, cried the wart. The rabbits won't be out in this wet said Kay sarcastically, delighted to have caught him out over natural history. Oh, come on, said the wart. It'll soon dry. I must carry Cully, then. Kay insisted on carrying the goshik and flying her when they went out together. This he had a right to do, not only because he was older than the wart, but also because he was Sir Ector's proper son. The wart was not a proper son. He did not understand about this, but it made him feel unhappy because Kay seemed to regard it as making him inferior in some way. Also it was different not having a father and mother, and Kay had taught him that being different was necessarily wrong. Nobody talked to him about it, but he thought about it when he was alone and was distressed. He did not like people to bring it up, and since the other boy always did bring it up when a question of precedence arose, he had got into the habit of giving in at once before it could be mentioned. Besides, he admired Kay and was a born follower. He was a hero worshipper. 
come on, then cried the wart, and they scampered off towards the muse turning a few cartwheels on the way. The muse was one of the most important parts of the castle, next to the stables and the kennels. It was opposite to the solar and faced south. The outside windows had to be small for reasons of fortification but the windows which looked inwards to the courtyard were big and sunny. All the windows had closed vertical slats nailed down them, but no horizontal ones. There was no glass, but to keep the hawks from drafts, there was horn in the small windows. At one end of the mews, there was a little fireplace and a kind of snuggery, like the place in a saddle room, where the grooms sit to clean their tack on wet winter nights after hunting. Here there were a couple of stools, a cauldron, a bench with all sorts of small knives and surgical instruments, and some shelves with pots on them. The pots were labeled cardamom, ginger, barley sugar, wrangle, for a snurt, for the cray, vertigo, etc. There were leather skins hanging up, which had been snipped about as pieces were cut out of them for jesses, hoods or leashes. On the neat row of nails there were Indian bells and swivels and silver barbels each with Ector cut on. A special shelf, and the most beautiful of all, held the hoods. Very old cracked rafter hoods which had been made for birds before Kay was born, tiny hoods for the merlins, small hoods for tiercels, splendid new hoods which had been knocked up to pass away the long winter evenings. All the hoods, except the rafters, were made in Sir Ector's colors. White leather with red bays at the sides and a bunch of blue-gray plumes on top made out of the hackle feathers of herons. On the bench there was a jumble of oddments, such as are to be found in every workshop, bits of cord, wire, metal tools, some bread and cheese which the mice had been at, a leather bottle, some frayed gauntlets for the left hand, nails, bits of sacking, a couple of lures, and some rough tallies scratched on the wood. These red, con is I I I I I I I I, harn three, etc. They were not spelt very well. Right down the length of the room, with the afternoon sun shining full on them, there ran the screen perches to which the birds were tied. There were two little merlins which had only just been taken up from hacking, an old peregrine who was not much use in this wooded country, but who was kept for appearances, a kestrel on which the boys had learnt the rudiments of falconry, a spar hawk which Sir Ector was kind enough to keep for the parson, and caged off in a special apartment of his own at the far end. There was the Tiersel Goshik Cully. The muse was neatly kept, with sawdust on the floor to absorb the mutes, and the castings taken up every day. Sir Ector visited the muse each morning at 7 o'clock, and the two ostrangers stood at attention outside the door. If they had forgotten to brush their hair, he confined them to barracks. They took no notice. Kay put on one of the left-handed gauntlets and called Cully from the perch. But Cully, with all his feathers close set and malevolent, glared at him with a mad marigold eye and refused to come. So Kay took him up. Do you think we ought to fly him? Asked the wart doubtfully. Deep in the mold like this? Of course we can fly him, Yan Nini said Kay. He only wants to be carried a bit, that's all. So they went out across the hay field, noting how the carefully raked hay was now sodden again and losing its goodness into the chase where the trees began to grow far apart as yet in park-like, but gradually crowding into the forest shade. The conies had hundreds of berries under these trees, so close together that the problem was not to find a rabbit, but find a rabbit far enough away from its hole. Hobbs says that we mustn't fly Cully till he has roused at least twice, said the wart. Hob doesn't know anything about it, said the other boy. Nobody can tell whether a hawk is fit to fly, except the man who is carrying it. Hob is only a villain anyway, added Kay, and began to undo the leash and swivel from the jesses. When he felt the trappings being taken off him, so that he was in hunting order, Cully did make some movements as if to rouse. He raised his crest, his shoulders coverts and the soft feathers of his thighs, but at the last moment he thought better or worse of it, and subsided without the rattle. 
This movement of the hawks made the wardage to carry him, so that he yearned to take him away from Kay, and set him to rights himself. He felt certain that he could get Cully into a good temper, by scratching his feet, and softly teasing his breast feathers upwards, if only he were allowed to do it himself, instead of having to plod along behind with the stupid lure. But he knew how annoying it must be for Kay to be continually subjected to advice, and so he held his peace. Just as in modern shooting you must never offer criticism to the man in command, so in hawking it was important that no outside advice should be allowed to disturb the judgment of the actual ostringer. So ho, cried Kay, throwing his arms upwards to give the hawk a better take off, and a rabbit was scooting across the close nibbled turf in front of them, and Cully was in the air. The movement had surprised the wart, the rabbit and the hawk all three, and all three hung a moment in surprise. Then the great wings of the aerial assassin began to row the air. But reluctantly and undecided, the rabbit vanished in a hidden hole, and up went the hawk, swooping like a child flung high in a swing, until the wings folded, and he was sitting in a tree. Cully looked down at his masters, opened his beak in an angry pant of failure, and remained motionless. The two hearts stood still. Chapter 2. A good while after that, when they had been whistling and luring and following the disturbed and sulky hawk from tree to tree, Kay lost his temper. Let him go, then said Kay. He's no use anyway. Oh, we couldn't leave him, cried the wart. What would Hob say? It's my hawk, not Hobbs, exclaimed Kay furiously. What does it matter what Hob says? He is my servant, but Hob made Cully. It's all right for us to lose him, for we didn't have to sit up with him three nights and carry him all day and all that. We can't lose Hobbs Hawk. It would be beastly. Serve him right, then. He's a fool and it's a rotten hawk. Who wants a rotten, stupid hawk? You'd better stay yourself, if you're so keen on it. I'm going home. I'll stay said the wart sadly, if you'll send Hob when you get back. Kay began walking off in the wrong direction, raging in his heart, because he knew that he had flown the bird when he was not properly in Yerak, and the ward had to shout after him the right way. Then he sat down under the tree and looked up at Cully like a cat watching a sparrow, but with his heart beating fast. It was all right for Kay who was not really keen on hawking, except in so far as it was the proper occupation for a boy in his station of life, but the wart had some of the falconer's feelings, and knew that a lost hawk was the greatest possible calamity. He knew that Hob had worked on Cully for 14 hours a day, over a period of months, in order to teach him his trade, and that his work had been like Jacob's struggle with the angel. When Cully was lost a part of Hob was lost too. The wart did not dare to face the look of reproach, which would be in Hob's eye, after all, that he had tried to teach them. What was he to do? He had better sit still, leaving the lure on the ground, so that Cully could settle down and come in his own time. But Cully had no intention of doing this. He had been given a generous crop the night before, so that he was not hungry. The hot day had put him in a bad temper. The waving and whistling of the boys below him, and their pursuit of him from tree to tree, had disturbed his never very powerful brains. Now, he did not quite know what he wanted to do, but it was not what anybody else wanted. He thought perhaps it would be nice to kill something, just from spite. A long time after that, the wart was on the verge of the true forest, and Cully inside it. In a series of infuriating removes they had come nearer and nearer till they were further from the castle than the wart had ever been, and now they had reached it quite. Wart would not have been frightened of a forest nowadays, but the great jungle of old England was a different thing. It was not only that there were wild boars in it whose sounders would at this season be furiously rooting about, 
nor that one of the surviving wolves might be slinking behind any tree with pale eyes and slavering chops. The man and wicked animals were not the only inhabitants of the crowded gloom. When men themselves became mad and wicked they took refuge there, outlaws cunning and bloody as the gork row, and as persecuted. The wart thought particularly of a man named Watt, whose name the cottagers used to frighten their children with. He had once lived in Sir Ector's village, and the wart could remember him. He squinted, had no nose, and was weak in his wits. The children threw stones at him. One day he turned on the children and caught one and made a snarly noise and bit off his nose too. Then he ran away into the forest. They threw stones at the child with no nose. Now, but what was supposed to be in the forest still running on all fours and dressed in skins? There were magicians in the forest also in those days, as well as strange animals not known to modern works of natural history. There were regular bands of outlaws, not like what, who lived together and wore green and shot with arrows which never missed. There were even a few dragons, though they were rather small ones, which lived under stones and could hiss like a kettle. Added to this, there was the fact that it was getting dark. The forest was trackless, and nobody in the village knew what was on the other side. The evening hush had fallen, and all the high trees stood looking at the wart without a sound. He felt that it would be safer to go home while he still knew where he was, but he had a stout heart and did not want to give in. He understood that once Kali had slept in freedom for a whole night he would be wild again and irreclamable. Kali was a passenger. But if the poor wart could only make him to roost, and if Hob would only arrive then with a dark lantern, they might still take him that night by climbing the tree, while he was sleepy and muddled with the light. He could see more or less where the hawk had perched, about a hundred yards within the thick trees, because the home-going rooks of evening were mobbing that place. Wart made a mark on one of the trees outside the forest, hoping that it might help him to find his way back, and then began to fight his way into the undergrowth as best he might. He heard by the rooks that Kali had immediately moved further off. The night fell still as the small boy struggled with the brambles. But he went on doggedly, listening with all his ears, and Cully's evasions became sleepier and shorter until at last, before the utter darkness fell, he could see the hunched shoulders in a tree above him against the sky. Wart sat down under the tree, so as not to disturb the bird any further as it went to sleep, and Cully, standing on one leg, ignored his existence. Perhaps said the wart to himself, even if Hob doesn't come, and I don't see how he can very well follow me in this trackless forest now. I shall be able to climb up by myself at about midnight, because he ought to be deep in sleep then. I could speak to him softly by name, so that he thought it was just the usual person coming to take him up while hooded. I shall have to climb very quietly. Then, if I do get in, I shall have to find my way home, and the drawbridge will be up. But perhaps somebody will wait for me, for Kay will have told them I am out. I wonder which way it was. I wish Kay had not gone. He snuggled down between the roots of the tree, trying to find a comfortable place where the hard wood did not stick into his shoulder blades. I think the way was behind that big spruce with the spiky top. I ought to try to remember which side of me the sun is setting, so that when it rises, I may keep it on the same side going home. Did something move under that spruce tree? I wonder, oh, I wish I may not meet that old wild wat and have my nose bitten off. How aggravating Cully looks, standing there on one leg, as if there was nothing the matter. At this there was a quick whir and a smack, and the wart found an arrow sticking in the tree wood between the fingers of his right hand. He snatched his hand away, thinking he had been stung by something, before he noticed it was an arrow. Then everything went slow. He had time to notice quite carefully what sort of an arrow it was, and how it had driven three inches into the solid wood. It was a black arrow with yellow bands round it, like a horrible wasp, and its cock feather was yellow. The two others were black. 
they were goose feathers. The wart found that, although he was frightened of the danger of the forest before it happened, once he was in it he was not frightened anymore. He got up quickly, but it seemed to him slowly, and went behind the other side of the tree. As he did this, another arrow came were and talk, but this one buried all except its feathers in the grass, and stayed there still, as if it had never moved. On the other side of the tree he found a waste of bracken, six foot high. This was splendid cover, but it betrayed his whereabouts by rustling. He heard another arrow hiss through the fronds, and what seemed to be a man's voice cursing but it was not very near. Then he heard the man, or whatever it was, running about in the bracken. It was reluctant to fire any more arrows because they were valuable things, and would certainly get lost in the undergrowth. Wart went like a snake, like a coney, like a silent owl. He was small, and the creature had no chance against him in this game. In five minutes he was safe. The assassin searched for his arrows and went away grumbling, but the wart realized that, even if he was safe, he had lost his way in his hawk. He had not the faintest idea where he was. He lay down for half an hour pressed under the fallen tree where he had hidden to give time for the thing to go right away and for his own heart to cease its thundering. It had begun beating like this as soon as he knew he had got away from the outlaw. Oh, thought the wart, now I am truly lost, and now there is almost no alternative except to have my nose bitten off, or to be pierced right through with one of those waspy arrows, or to be eaten by a hissing dragon or a wolf or a wild boar or a magician, if magicians do eat boys, which I expect they do. Now I may well wish that I had been a good boy, and not angered the governess when she got muddled with her astrolabe, and had loved my dear guardian Sir Ector, as much as he deserved. At these melancholy thoughts, and especially at the recollections of kind Sir Ector with his pitchfork and his big red nose, the poor wart's eyes became full of tears, and he lay most desolate beneath the tree. The sun finished the last rays of its lingering goodbye, and the moon rose in awful majesty over the silver treetops before he dared to rise. Then he got up and dusted the twigs out of his jerkin and wandered off forlornly, taking the easiest way always and trusting himself to God. He had been walking like this for about half an hour and sometimes sighing to himself and sometimes feeling more cheerful because it really was very cool and lovely in the summer forest by moonlight, when he came upon the most beautiful thing that he had ever seen in his short life. There was a clearing in the forest, a wide sward of moonlit grass, and the white rays shone full upon the tree trunks on the opposite side. These trees were beeches whose trunks are always most beautiful in a pearly light, and among the beeches, there was the smallest movement and a silvery clink. Before the clink there were just beaches, but immediately afterwards there was a knight in full armor, standing still and silent and unearthly, among the majestic trunks. He was mounted on an enormous white horse that stood as rapt as its master, and he carried in his right hand with its butt resting on the stirrup a high, smooth jousting lance, which stood up among the tree stumps higher and higher, till it was outlined against the velvet sky. All was moonlit, all silver, too beautiful to describe. The wart did not know what to do. He did not know whether it would be safe to go up to this night, for there were so many terrible things in the forest that even the knight might be a ghost. Most ghostly he looked too, as he hoved meditating on the confines of the gloom. Eventually the wart made up his mind that even if it was a ghost, it would be the ghost of a knight, and knights were bound by their vows to help people in distress. Excuse me said the wart, when he was right under the mysterious figure, but can you tell me the way back to Sir Ector's castle? At this the ghost jumped violently, so that it nearly fell off its horse, and gave out a muffled bawling noise through its visor, 
like a flock of sheep. Excuse me began the ward again and stopped terrified in the middle of his speech, for the ghost lifted up its visor revealing two enormous eyes frosted like ice, exclaimed in an anxious voice, what, what, took off its eyes which turned out to be horn rim spectacles, completely fogged by being inside the helmet tried to wipe them on the horse's mane, which only made them worse, lifted both hands above its head and tried to wipe them on its plume, dropped its lance, dropped the spectacles, got off the horse to search for them the visor shutting in the process, lifted its visor, bent down for the spectacles, stood up again as the visor shut once more, and exclaimed in a plaintive voice, D, D. The wart found the spectacles, wiped them, and gave them to the ghost, who immediately put them on, the visor shut again at once, and began scrambling back on the horse for dear life. When it was there it held out its hand for the lance, which the wart handed up, and feeling all secure, opened its visor with its left hand and held it open. It peered at the wart with one hand up, like a lost mariner searching for land, and exclaimed, Aha, whom have we he, what what, please said the wart, I am a boy whose guardian is Sir Ector. Charming fella said the knight, charming fella, never met him in my life, can you tell me the way back to his castle? Faintest idea said the knight, faintest idea, stranger in these parts myself, I have got lost said the wart. Funny thing that, funny thing that, what, now a have been lost for 17 years. Name of King Pelliner continued the knight, may have heard of me, what, here the visor shut with a pop, like an echo to the what, but was opened again immediately. 17 years ago, come Michaelmas, and been after the questing beast ever since. Boring, very. I should think it would be said the wart, who had never heard of King Pelliner, or the questing beast, but felt that this was the safest thing to say in the circumstances. It is the burden of the Pelliners, said the knight proudly, only a Pelliner can catch it, that is, of course, or his next of kin. Train all the Pelliners with that idea in mind, limited education, rather, fumits, and all that. I know what fumits are said the wart with interest, they are the droppings of the beast pursued. The harbor keeps them in his horn to show to his master, and can tell by them whether it is a warrantable beast or otherwise, and what state it is in. Intelligent child remarked King Pelliner. Very. Now a carry fumits about with me practically all the time. Insanitary habit added the king beginning to look rather dejected and quite pointless. Only one questing beast, you know, what, so there can't be any question whether it is warrantable or not. Here his visor began to droop so much that the wart decided he had better forget his own troubles and try to cheer his companion up by asking questions on the one subject about which King Pelliner seemed qualified to speak. Even talking to a lost royalty was better than being alone in the wood. What does the questing beast look like? Ah, uh, we call it the beast Gladysant, you know replied the monarch, assuming a learned air, and beginning to speak quite volubly. Now, the beast Gladysant, or, as we say in English, the questing beast you may call it either he added graciously. This beast has the head of a serpent, ah, and the body of a libbard, the haunches of a lion, and he is footed like a heart. Wherever this beast goes, he makes a noise in his belly, as it had been the noise of thirty couples of hounds questing. Except when he is drinking, of course added the king severely, as if he had rather shocked himself by leaving this out. It must be a dreadful kind of monster said the wart, looking at him anxiously. A dreadful monster repeated the other complacently, it is the beast Gladysant, you know, and how do you follow it? This seemed to be the wrong kind of question, for King Pelliner immediately began to look much more depressed than ever and glanced over his shoulder so hurriedly that his visor shut down altogether. A have a brache said King Pelliner sadly, as soon as he had restored himself. There she is, over thee. 
The wart looked in the direction which had been indicated with a despondent thumb and saw a lot of rope wound round a tree. The other end of the rope was tied to King Pelliner's saddle. I don't see her very well. Wound herself round the other side of the tree, I dare say, said the king, without looking round. She always goes the opposite way to me. The wart went over to the tree and found a large white dog scratching herself for fleas. As soon as she saw the wart, she began wagging her whole body, grinning vacuously, and panting in her efforts to lick his face in spite of the cord. She was too tangled up to move. It's quite a good brache, said King Pelliner, only it pants so, and gets wound round things, and goes the opposite way. What with that and the visor, what, a sometimes don't know which way to turn. Why don't you let her loose, asked the wart. She would follow the beast just as well like that. She just goes right away then, you know, and a don't see her sometimes for a week. Gets a bit lonely without her added the king wistfully, following this beast about, what, and never knowing where one is, makes a bit of company, you know. She seems to have a friendly nature said the wart, too friendly, sometimes a doubt whether she is really after the beast at all. What does she do when she sees it? Nothing said King Pelliner. Oh, well said the wart, I dare say she will get to be interested in it after a time. It's eight months anyway since A saw the beast at all. King Pelliner's voice had got sadder and sadder since the beginning of the conversation, and now he definitely began to sniffle. It's the curse of the Pelliners he exclaimed, always mulocking about after that beastly beast. What on earth use is it, anyway? First you have to stop to unwind the brache, then your visor falls down, then you can't see through your spectacles. Nowhere to sleep, never know where you are. Rheumatism in the winter, sunstroke in the summer. All this beastly armor takes hours to put on. When it is on it's either frying or freezing, and it gets rusty. You have to sit up all night polishing the stuff. Oh, how a do wish a had a nice house of my own to live in, a house with beds in it, and real pillows and sheets. If a was rich that's what a would buy, a nice bed with a nice pillow and a nice sheet that you could lie in, and then a would put this beastly horse in a meadow and tell that beastly brash a to run away and play and throw all this beastly armor out of the window and let the beastly beast go and chase itself that I would. If you could only show me the way home, said the ward craftily, I am sure Sir Ector would put you up in a bed for the night. Do you really mean it? cried King Pelliner. In a bed? A feather bed, said the ward firmly. King Pelliner's eyes grew as round as saucers. A feather bed, he repeated slowly. Would it have pillows? Down pillows. Down pillows, whispered the king, holding his breath, and then, letting it all out in a rush. What a lovely house your guardian must have. I don't think it is more than two hours away, said the wart, following up his advantage. And did this gentleman really send you out to invite me in? Inquired the king wonderingly. He had forgotten all about the wart being lost. How nice of him, how very nice of him, eh do think? What? He will be very pleased to see us, said the wart, quite truthfully. Oh, how nice of him, exclaimed the king again, beginning to bustle about his various trappings. And what a lovely gentleman he must be to have a feather bed. I suppose I should have to share it with somebody? He added doubtfully. You could have one of your very own. A feather bed of one's very own exclaimed King Pelliner, with sheets and a pillow perhaps even two pillows, or a pillow and a bolster, and no need to get up in time for breakfast. Does your guardian get up in time for breakfast? inquired the king, a momentary doubt striking him. Never said the wart. Fleas in the bed? asked the king suspiciously. Not one. Well, said King Pelliner, it does sound too nice for words, a must say, a feather bed and none of those beastly fumits for ever so long. How long did you say it would take us to get there? Two hours, said the wart. 
but he had to shout the second of these words, for the sounds were drowned in his mouth by a dreadful noise, which had that moment arisen close beside them. What was that? exclaimed the wart. Hark! cried the king. Oh, mercy! wailed the wart. It's the beast! shouted the king. And immediately the loving huntsman had forgotten everything else, but was busied about his task. He wiped his spectacles upon the seat of his trousers, the only accessible piece of cloth about him, while the belling and bloody cry arose all round balanced them on the end of his long nose, just before the visor automatically clapped to, clutched his jousting lance in his right hand, and galloped off in the direction of the noise. He was brought up short by the rope which was wound round the tree, the vacuous brashay meanwhile giving a melancholy yelp and fell off his horse with a tremendous clang. In a second he was up again. The wart was convinced that his spectacles must be broken, and hopping round the white horse with one foot in the stirrup. The girth stood the test and he was in the saddle somehow, with his jousting lance between his legs, and then he was galloping round and round the tree, in the opposite direction to that in which the brache had wound herself up. He went round three times too often, the brache meanwhile running and yelping in the opposite direction, and then, after four or five back casts, they were both free of the obstruction. Yikes! What? cried King Pelliner, waving his lance in the air, and swaying excitedly in the saddle. Then he disappeared completely into the gloom of the forest, with the unfortunate brache trailing and howling behind him at the other end of the string. Chapter 3. The wart slept well in the woodland nest where he had laid himself down, in that kind of thin but refreshing sleep, which people have when they first lie out of doors. At first he only dipped below the surface of sleep and skimmed along like a salmon in shallow water, so close to the surface that he fancied himself in the air. He thought himself awake when he was already asleep. He saw the stars above his face, whirling round on their silent and sleepless axis, and the leaves of the trees rustling against them, and heard small changes in the grass. These little noises of footsteps and soft fringed wing beats and stealthy bellies, drawn over the grass blades or rattling against the bracken, at first frightened or interested him so that he moved to see what they were, but never saw, then soothed him, so that he no longer cared to see what they were, but trusted them to be themselves, and finally left him altogether as he swam down deeper and deeper, nuzzling his nose into the scented turf, into the warm ground, into the unending waters under the earth. It had been difficult to go to sleep in the bright summer moonlight, but once he was there it was not difficult to stay. The sun came early causing him to turn over in protest, but in going to sleep he had learnt to vanquish light, and now the light could not rewake him. It was nine o'clock, five hours after daylight, before he rolled over, opened his eyes, and was awake at once. He was hungry. The ward had heard about people who lived on berries, but this did not seem practical at the moment, because it was July, and there were none. He found two wild strawberries and ate them greedily. They tasted nicer than anything, so he wished there were more. Then he wished it was April, so that he could find some bird's eggs and eat those, or that he had not lost his goshic cully, so that the bird could catch him a rabbit which he would cook by rubbing two sticks together like the base Indian. But he had lost Kali, or he would not have lost himself, and probably the sticks would not have lit in any case. He decided that he could not have gone more than three or four miles from home, so the best thing he could do would be to sit still and listen. Then he might hear the noise of the haymakers, if he was lucky with the wind and could hearken his way home by that. What he did hear was a faint clanking noise, which made him think that King Pelliner must be after the questing beast again, close by. Only the noise was so regular and single in intention, 
that it made him think of King Pelliner doing some special action with great patience and concentration, trying to scratch his back without taking off his armor, for instance. He went towards the noise. There was a clearing in the forest, and in this clearing there was a snug little cottage built of stone. It was a cottage although the wart could not notice this at the time, which was divided into two bits. The main bit was the hall or every purpose room, which was high because it extended from floor to roof, and this room had a fire on the floor, whose smoke issued eventually out of a hole in the thatch of the roof. The other half of the cottage was divided into two rooms by a horizontal floor, which made the top half into a bedroom and study while the bottom half served for a larder, store room, stable and barn. A white donkey lived in this downstairs room and a ladder led to the one upstairs. There was a well in front of the cottage and the metallic noise which the ward had heard was caused by a very old gentleman who was drawing water out of it by means of a handle and chain. Clank, 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 said the chain, until the bucket hit the lip of the well, and oh, drat the whole thing, said the old gentleman. You would think that after all these years of study, one could do better for oneself than a by our lady well with a by our lady bucket, whatever the by our lady cost. I wish to goodness added the old gentleman, heaving his bucket out of the well with a malevolent glance, that I was only on the electric light and company's water, drat it. The old gentleman that the wart saw was a singular spectacle. He was dressed in a flowing gown with fur tippets, which had the signs of the zodiac embroidered all over it, together with various cabalistic signs, as of triangles with eyes in them, queer crosses, leaves of trees, bones and birds and animals, and a planetarium whose stars shone like bits of looking glass with the sun on them. He had a pointed hat like a dunce's cap, or like the headgear worn by ladies of that time, except that the ladies were accustomed to have a bit of veil floating from the top of it. He also had a wand of lignum vitae, which he had laid down in the grass beside him, and a pair of horn-rimmed spectacles like those of King Pelliner. They were extraordinary spectacles, being without earpieces, but shaped rather like scissors or the, the antennae of the tarantula wasp. Excuse me, sir, said the wart, but can you tell me the way to Sir Ector's castle, if you don't mind? The aged gentleman put down his bucket and looked at the wart. Your name would be Wart, he said. Yes, sir. Please, sir, said the wart. My name, said the aged gentleman, is Merlin. How do you do, said the wart. How do you do, said Merlin. It is clement weather, is it not? It is said the wart for the time of the year. When these formalities had been concluded, the wart had leisure to examine his new acquaintance more closely. The aged gentleman was staring at him with a kind of unwinking and benevolent curiosity which made him feel that it would not be at all rude to stare back. No ruder than it would be to stare at one of his guardian's cows, who happened to be ruminating his personality as she leant her head over a gate. Merlin had a long white beard and long white mustache which hung down on either side of it, and close inspection showed that he was far from clean. It was not that he had dirty fingernails or anything like that, but some large birds seemed to have been nesting in his hair. The wart was familiar with the nests of spar hawk and goes, those crazy conglomerations of sticks and oddments which had been taken over from squirrels and crows, and he knew how the twigs and the tree foot were splashed with white mutes, old bones, muddy feathers and castings. This was the impression which he gathered from Merlin. The old gentleman was streaked with droppings over his shoulders, among the stars and triangles of his gown, and a large spider was slowly lowering itself from the tip of his hat, as he gazed and slowly blinked at the little boy in front of him. He had a faintly worried expression, as though he were trying to remember some name which began with Chol, but which was pronounced in quite a different way, possibly Menzies or was it Dalziel? 
His mild blue eyes, very big and round under the tarantula spectacles, gradually filmed and clouded over as he gazed at the boy, and then he turned his head away with a resigned expression, as though it was all too much for him after all. Do you like peaches? asked the old gentleman. Very much indeed answered the wart, and his mouth began to water, so that it was full of sweet, soft liquid. It is only July, you know said the old man reprovingly, and walked off in the direction of the cottage without looking round. The wart followed after him, since this was the simplest thing to do, and offered to carry the bucket, which seemed to please the old gentleman who gave it to him and waited while he counted his keys and muttered and mislaid them and dropped them in the grass. Finally, when they had got their way into the black and white cottage with as much trouble as if they were burglaring it, he climbed up the ladder after his host and found himself in the upstairs room. It was the most marvelous room that the ward had ever been in. There was a real cork and drill hanging from the rafters, very lifelike and horrible with glass eyes and scaly tail stretched out behind it. When its master came into the room it winked one eye in salutation, although it was stuffed. There were hundreds of thousands of brown books in leather bindings, some chained to the bookshelves and others propped up against each other, as if they had had too much spirits to drink and did not really trust themselves. These gave out a smell of must and solid brownness which was most secure. Then there were stuffed birds, papinjays, and maggot pies, and kingfishers, and peacocks with all their feathers, but two, and tiny birds like beetles, and a reputed phoenix which smelt of incense and cinnamon. It could not have been a real phoenix, because there is only one of these at a time. Over the mantelpiece there was a fox's mask with grafton. Buckingham to Daventry 2 HRS 20 mins written under it, and also a 40 pound salmon with a 43 min bulldog written under it, and a very lifelike basilisk with Crowhurst otter hounds in Roman print. There were several boar's tusks and the claws of tigers and liberts mounted in symmetrical patterns, and a big head of Ovis poli, six live grass snakes in a kind of aquarium, some nests of the solitary wasp nicely set up in a glass cylinder, an ordinary beehive whose inhabitants went in and out of the window unmolested two young hedgehogs in cotton wool. A pair of badgers which immediately began to cry yik 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 in loud voices, as soon as the magician appeared, twenty boxes which contained stick caterpillars and sixths of the puss moth, and even an allender that was worth two and six, all feeding on the appropriate leaves. A gun case with all sorts of weapons, which would not be invented for half a thousand years, a rod box ditto. A lovely chest of drawers full of salmon flies, which had been tied by Merlin himself, another chest whose drawers were labeled Mandragora, Mandrake, Old Man's Beard, etc., a bunch of turkey feathers and goose quills for making pens, an astrolabe, twelve pairs of boots, a dozen purse nets, three dozen rabbit wires, twelve corkscrews, an ant's nest between two glass plates, ink bottles of every possible color from red to violet, darning needles, a gold medal for being the best scholar at Eton, four or five recorders, a nest of field mice all alive o two skulls, plenty of cut glass, Venetian glass, Bristol glass and a bottle of mastic varnish, some Satsuma china and some cloisonne, the 14th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Marred as it was by the sensationalism of the popular plates, two paint boxes, one oil, one watercolor, three globes of the known geographical world, a few fossils, the stuffed head of a camel leopard, six pismires, some glass retorts with cauldrons, bunts and burners, etc., and the complete set of cigarette cards depicting wildfowl by Peter Scott. Merlin took off his pointed hat when he came into this extraordinary chamber, because it was too high for the roof, and immediately there was a little scamper in one of the dark corners, and a flap of soft wings, and a young tawny owl was sitting on the black skull cap, which protected the top of his head. Oh, what a lovely owl! 
cried the wart, but when he went up to it and held out his hand, the owl grew half as tall again, stood up as stiff as a poker, closed its eyes, so that there was only the smallest slit to peep through, as one is in the habit of doing when told to shut one's eyes at hide and seek, and said in a doubtful voice, there is no owl. Then it shut its eyes entirely and looked the other way. It's only a boy said Merlin. There is no boy said the owl hopefully, without turning round. The wart was so startled by finding that the owl could talk that he forgot his manners and came closer still. At this the owl became so nervous that it made a mess on Merlin's head, the whole room was quite white with droppings, and flew off to perch on the farthest tip of the cork and drill's tail out of reach. We see so little company explained Merlin, wiping his head with half a worn out pair of pajama tops, which he kept for that purpose that Archimedes is a little shy of strangers. Come, Archimedes, I want you to meet a friend of mine called Wart. Here he held out his hand to the owl, who came waddling like a goose along the cork and drill's back. He waddled with this rolling gait so as to keep his tail from being damaged, and hopped down onto Merlin's finger, with every sign of reluctance. Hold out your finger said Merlin, and put it behind his legs. No, lift it up under his train. When the wart had done this Merlin moved the owl gently backwards, so that the wart's finger pressed against its legs from behind, and it either had to step back on the finger, or get pushed off its balance altogether. It stepped back. The wart stood there delighted while the furry little feet held tight onto his finger, and the sharp claws prickled his skin. Say how die you do properly said Merlin. I won't said Archimedes, looking the other way and holding very tight. Oh, he is lovely said the wart again. Have you had him very long? Archimedes has stayed with me since he was quite small, indeed since he had a tiny head like a chicken's. I wish he would talk to me said the wart. Perhaps if you were to give him this mouse here politely, he might learn to know you better. Merlin took the dead mouse out of his skullcap I always keep them there he explained and worms too for fishing. I find it most convenient and handed it to the wart who held it out rather gingerly towards Archimedes. The nutty little curved beak looked as if it were capable of doing damage, but Archimedes looked closely at the mouse, blinked at the wart, moved nearer on the finger, closed his eyes and leant forward. He stood there with closed eyes and an expression of rapture on his face, as if he were saying grace, and then, with the absurdest little sideways nibble, took the morsel so gently that he would not have broken a soap bubble. He remained leaning forward with closed eyes, with the mouse suspended from his beak, as if he were not sure what to do with it. Then he lifted his right foot he was right-handed and took hold of the mouse. He held it up like a boy holding a stick of rock or a constable with his truncheon, looked at it, nibbled its tail. He turned it round so that it was head first for the ward it offered it the wrong way round and gave one gulp. He looked round at the company with the tail hanging out of the corner of his mouth, as much as to say, I wish you would not all stare at me, so turned his head away, politely swallowed the tail, scratched his sailor's beard with his left toe, and began to ruffle out his feathers. Let him alone said Merlin, now, for perhaps he does not want to be friends with you until he knows what you are like. With owls, it is never easy come and easy go. Perhaps he will sit on my shoulder said the wart, and with that he instinctively lowered his hand, so that the owl, who liked to be as high as possible, ran up the slope and stood shyly beside his ear. Now breakfast said Merlin. The wart saw that the most perfect breakfast was laid out neatly for two, on the table before the window, there were peaches, there were also melons, strawberries and cream, rusks, brown trout piping hot, grilled perch which were much nicer, chicken deviled enough to burn one's mouth out, kidneys and mushrooms on toast, fricassee curry, and a choice of boiling coffee or best chocolate made with cream in large cups. Have some mustard said Merlin, when they had got to the kidneys. 
The mustard pot got up and walked over to his plate on thin silver legs that waddled like the owls. Then it uncurled its handles, and one handle lifted its lid with exaggerated courtesy, while the other helped him to a generous spoonful. Oh, I love the mustard pot, cried the wart. Wherever did you get it? At this the pot beamed all over its face and began to strut a bit, but Merlin wrapped it on the head with a teaspoon, so that it sat down and shut up at once. It's not a bad pot he said grudgingly, only it is inclined to give itself airs. The wart was so much impressed by the kindness of the old magician, and particularly by all the lovely things which he possessed, that he hardly liked to ask him personal questions. It seemed politer to sit still and speak when he was spoken to, but Merlin did not speak very much, and when he did speak it was never in questions, so that the wart had little opportunity for conversation. At last his curiosity got the better of him, and he asked something which had been puzzling him for some time. Would you mind if I ask you a question? It is what I am for said Merlin sadly. How did you know to set the breakfast for two? The old gentleman leaned back in his chair and lit an enormous meerschaum pipe good gracious, he breathes fire thought the wart who had never heard of tobacco before he was ready to reply. Then he looked puzzled, took off his skull cap, three mice fell out and scratched in the middle of his bald head. Have you ever tried to draw in a looking glass? Asked Merlin. I don't think I have said the wart. Looking glass said the old gentleman, holding out his hand. Immediately there was a tiny lady's vanity glass in his hand. Not that kind, you fool said Merlin angrily. I want one big enough to shave in. The vanity glass vanished, and in its place there was a shaving mirror about a foot square. Merlin then demanded pencil and paper in quick succession, got an unsharpened pencil in the morning post, sent them back, got a fountain pen with no ink in it, and six reams of brown paper suitable for parcels, sent them back, flew into a passion in which he said by our lady quite often and ended up with a carbon pencil and some cigarette papers which he said would have to do. He put one of the papers in front of the glass and made five dots on it like this. Now he said, I want you to join those five dots up to make a W, looking only in the glass. The wart took the pen and tried to do as he was bid, but after a lot of false starts the letter which he produced was this. Well, it isn't bad said Merlin doubtfully, and in a way it does look a bit like an M. Then he fell into a reverie, stroking his beard, breathing fire, and staring at the paper. About the breakfast? Asked the wart timidly, after he had waited five minutes. Ah, uh, yes said Merlin. How did I know to set breakfast for two? That was why I showed you the looking glass. Now ordinary people are born forwards in time, if you understand what I mean, and nearly everything in the world goes forward too. This makes it quite easy for the ordinary people to live just as it would be easy to join those five dots into a W if you were allowed to look at them forwards instead of backwards and inside out. But I unfortunately was born at the wrong end of time, and I have to live backwards from in front, while surrounded by a lot of people living forwards from behind. Some people call it having second sight. Merlin stopped talking and looked at the ward in an anxious way. Have I told you this before? He inquired suspiciously. No said the wart, we only met about half an hour ago, so little time to pass as that, said Merlin, and a big tear ran down to the end of his nose. He wiped it off with his pajama tops and added anxiously, am I going to tell it you again? I don't know said the wart, unless you haven't finished telling me yet. You see said Merlin, one gets confused with time when it is like that. All one's tenses get muddled up, for one thing. If you know what's going to happen to people, and not what has happened to them, it makes it so difficult to prevent it happening, if you don't want it to have happened, if you see what I mean, like drawing in a mirror. The wart did not quite see, but was just going to say that he was sorry for Merlin if these things made him unhappy when he felt a curious sensation at his ear. 
don't jump said Merlin, just as he was going to do so, and the wart sat still. Archimedes, who had been standing forgotten on his shoulder all this time, was gently touching himself against him. His beak was right against the lobe of his ear, which its bristles made to tickle, and suddenly, a soft hoarse little voice whispered, how do you do, so that it sounded right inside his head. Oh, owl, cried the wart, forgetting about Merlin's troubles instantly. Look, he has decided to talk to me. The wart gently leant his head against the soft feathers, and the brown owl, taking the rim of his ear in its beak, quickly nibbled right round it with the smallest nibbles. I shall call him Archie, exclaimed the wart. I trust you will do nothing of the sort cried Merlin instantly in a stern and angry voice, and the owl withdrew to the farthest corner of his shoulder. Is it wrong? You might as well call me Wool, or Ollie said the owl sourly, and have done with it, or Bubbles added the owl in a bitter voice. Merlin took the wart's hand and said kindly, you are only young, and do not understand these things, but you will learn that owls are the politest and the most courteous, single-hearted and faithful creatures living. You must never be familiar, rude or vulgar with them, or make them to look ridiculous. Their mother is Athene, the goddess of wisdom, and, though they are often ready to play the buffoon for your amusement, such conduct is the prerogative of the truly wise. No owl can possibly be called Archie. I am sorry, owl said the wart. And I am sorry, boy said the owl. I can see that you spoke in ignorance, and I bitterly regret that I should have been so petty as to take offense where none was intended. The owl really did regret it and looked so remorseful and upset that Merlin had to put on a very cheerful manner and change the conversation. Well said E, now that we have finished breakfast, I think it is high time that we should all three find our way back to Sir Ector. Excuse me a moment he added as an afterthought, and turning round to the breakfast things, he pointed a knobbly finger at them and said in a stern voice, wash up. At this all the china and cutlery scrambled down off the table, the cloth emptied the crumbs out of the window, and the napkins folded themselves up, all ran off down the ladder to where Merlin had left the bucket, and there was such a noise and yelling, as if a lot of children had been let out of school. Merlin went to the door and shouted, mind, nobody is to get broken. But his voice was entirely drowned in shrill squeals, splashes, and cries of my. It is cold I shan't stay in long look out, you'll break me or come on, let's duck the teapot. Are you really coming all the way home with me? Asked the wart who could hardly believe the good news. Why not? said Merlin. How else can I be your tutor? At this the wart's eyes grew rounder and rounder, until they were about as big as the owl's who was sitting on his shoulder, and his face got redder and redder, and a big breath seemed to gather itself beneath his heart. My! exclaimed the wart, while his eyes sparkled with excitement at the discovery. I must have been on a quest. Chapter 4. The wart started talking before he was halfway over the drawbridge. Look who I've brought he said. Look, I've been on a quest. I was shot at with three arrows. They had black and yellow stripes. The owl is called Archimedes. I saw King Pelliner. This is my tutor, Merlin. I went on a quest for him. He was after the questing beast. I mean King Pelliner. It was terrible in the forest. Merlin made the plates wash up. Hello, Hob. Look, we have got Cully. Hob just looked at the wart, but so proudly that the wart went quite red. It was such a pleasure to be back home again with all his friends and everything achieved. Hob said gruffly, Ah, master, us shall make an ostringer of ye yet. He came for Cully, as if he could not keep his hands off him any longer, but he patted the wart too, fondling them both because he was not sure which he was gladder to see back, 
He took Cully on his own fist, reassuming him like a lame man putting on his accustomed wooden leg after it had been lost. Merlin caught him said the wart. He sent Archimedes to look for him on the way home. Then Archimedes told us that he had been and killed a pigeon and was eating it. We went and frightened him off. After that, Merlin stuck six of the tail feathers round the pigeon in a circle and made a loop in a long piece of string to go round the feathers. He tied one end to a stick in the ground and he went away behind a bush with the other end. He said he wouldn't use magic. He said you couldn't use magic in great arts, like it would be unfair to make a great statue by magic. You have to cut it out with a chisel, you see. Then Cully came down to finish the pigeon, and we pulled the string, and the loop slipped over the feathers and caught him round the legs. He was angry, but we gave him the pigeon. Hob made a duty to Merlin, who returned it courteously. They looked upon one another with grave affection and eagerness, knowing each other to be masters of the same trade. When they could be alone together they could talk and talk, although each was naturally a silent man. Meanwhile they must wait their time. Oh, Kay cried the wart, as the latter appeared with their nurse and other delighted welcomers. Look I have got a magician for our tutor. He has a mustard pot that walks. I am glad you are back said Kay. Alas, where did you sleep Master Art? exclaimed the nurse. Look at your clean jerkin all muddied and torn. Such a turn as you gave us. I really don't know. But look at your poor hair with all them twigs in it. Oh, my own random, wicked little lamb. Sir Ector came bustling out with his greaves on back to front and kissed the ward on both cheeks. Well, 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 he exclaimed moistly. Here we are again. Hey, what the devil have you been doing? Hey, setting the whole household upside down. But inside him he was proud of the wart for staying out after a hawk and prouder still to see that he had got it for all the while. Hob held the bird in the air for everybody to see. Oh, sir, said the wart. I have been on that quest you said for a tutor and I have found him. Please, he is this gentleman here and he is called Merlin. He has got some badgers and hedgehogs and mice and things on this white donkey here because we couldn't leave them behind to starve. He is a great musician and can make things come out of the air. Ah, a magician said Sir Ector, putting on his glasses and looked closely at Merlin. White magic, I hope? Assuredly said Merlin, who stood patiently among all this throng with his arms folded in his necromantic gown, and Archimedes sitting very stiff and elongated on the top of his head. Ought to have some testimonials, you know said Sir Ector doubtfully. It's usual. Testimonials said Merlin, holding out his hand. Instantly there were some heavy tablets in it, signed by Aristotle, a parchment signed by Hecate and some typewritten duplicates signed by the Master of Trinity who could not remember having met him. All these gave Merlin an excellent character. He had him up his sleeve said Sir Ector wisely. Can you do anything else? Tree said Merlin. At once there was an enormous mulberry growing in the middle of the courtyard, with its luscious blue fruits ready to patter down. They do it with mirrors, said Sir Ector. Snow said Merlin. And an umbrella he added hastily. Before they could turn round the copper sky of summer had assumed a cold and lowering bronze, while the biggest white flakes that were ever seen were floating about them and settling on the battlements. An inch of snow had fallen before they could speak, and all were trembling with the wintry blast. Sir Ector's nose was blue and had an icicle hanging from the end of it while all except Merlin had a ledge of snow upon their shoulders. Merlin stood in the middle, holding his umbrella high because of the owl. It's done by hypnotism said Sir Ector with chattering teeth, like those wallas from the Indies. But that'll do, you know he added hastily, that'll do very well. I'm sure you'll make an excellent tutor for teaching these boys. The snow stopped immediately and the sun came out enough to give a body a pneumonia, said the nurse, or to frighten the elastic commissioners, while Merlin folded up his umbrella and handed it back to the heir, which received it. 
Imagine the boy doing a quest like that all by himself, exclaimed Sir Ector. Well, 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 wonders never cease. I don't think much of it as a quest said Kay, he only went after the hawk, after all. And got the hawk, Master Kay said Hob reprovingly. Oh well said Kay, I bet the old man caught it for him. Kay said Merlin, suddenly terrible, thou wast ever a proud and ill-tongued speaker, and a misfortunate one. Thy sorrow will come from thine own mouth. At this everybody felt uncomfortable, and Kay, instead of flying into his usual passion, hung his head. He was not at all an unpleasant person really, but clever, quick, proud, passionate and ambitious. He was one of those people who would be neither a follower or a leader, but only an aspiring heart, impatient in the failing body which imprisoned it. Merlin repented of his rudeness at once. He made a little silver hunting knife come out of the air, which he gave him to put things right. The knob of the handle was made of the skull of a stoat oiled and polished like ivory, and Kay loved it. Chapter 5. Sir Ector's home was called the Castle of the Forest Savage. It was more like a town or a village than any one man's home, and indeed it was the village during all times of danger. Whenever there was a raid or an invasion, everybody on the estate hurried into the castle, driving all the beasts before them into the courts, and there they remained until the danger was over. The little wattle and daub cottages nearly always got burnt, and had to be built again afterwards with much profanity. For this reason it was not worthwhile troubling to have a village church, as it would constantly be having to be replaced. The villagers went to church in the chapel of the castle. They wore their best clothes and trooped up the street with their most respectable gait on Sundays, looking with vague and dignified looks in all directions, as if reluctant to disclose their destination, and on weekdays they came to Mass and Vespers in their ordinary clothes, walking much more cheerfully. Everybody went to church in those days and liked it. The castle of the forest Savage is still standing, and you can see its lovely ruined walls with ivy on them, standing broached to the sun and wind. Some lizards live there now, and the starving sparrows keep warm on winter nights in the ivy, and a barn owl drives it methodically, hovering outside the little frightened congregations, and beating the ivy with its wings to make them fly out. Most of the curtain wall is down, though you can trace the foundations of the twelve round towers which guarded it. They are round and stuck out from the wall into the moat, so that the archers could fire in all directions and command every part of the wall. Inside the towers there are circular stairs. These go round and round a central column, and this column is pierced with holes for shooting arrows. Even if the enemy had got inside the curtain wall and fought its way into the bottom of the towers, the defenders could retreat up the bends of the stairs and shoot at those who followed them up, inside through the slits. The stone part of the drawbridge with its barbican and the bartizans of the gatehouse are in good repair. These have many ingenious arrangements, even if you got over the wooden bridge which was pulled up so that you couldn't, there was a portcullis weighed with an enormous log which would squash you flat and pin you down as well. There was a large hidden trapdoor in the floor of the barbican which would let you into the moat after all. At the other end of the barbican there was another portcullis, so that you could be trapped between the two and annihilated from above while the bartizans or hanging turrets had holes in their floors through which the defenders could drop things on your head. Finally, inside the gatehouse, there was a neat little hole in the middle of the vaulted ceiling, which had painted tracery in bosses. This hole led to the room above where there was a big cauldron for boiling lead and oil in. 
so much for the outer defenses. Once you were inside the curtain wall, you found yourself in a kind of white alleyway, probably full of frightened sheep, with another complete castle in front of you. This was the inner shell keep, with its eight enormous round towers which still stand. It is lovely to climb the highest of them and to lie there looking out towards the marches from which all these old dangers came with nothing but the sun above you and the little tourists trotting about below, quite regardless of arrows and boiling oil. Think of how many centuries that unconquerable tower has withstood. It has changed hands by secession often, by siege once, by treachery twice, but never by assault. On this tower the lookout moved. From here he kept the guard over the blue woods towards Wales. His clean old bones lie beneath the floor of the chapel now, so you must keep it for him. If you look down and are not frightened of heights, the Society for the Preservation of This and That have put up some excellent railings to preserve you from tumbling over, you can see the whole anatomy of the inner court laid out beneath you like a map. You can see the chapel, now quite open to its god, and the windows of the great hall with the solar over it. You can see the shafts of the huge chimneys, and how cunningly the side flues were contrived to enter them, and the little private closets now public, and the enormous kitchen. If you are a sensible person, you will spend days there, possibly weeks, working out for yourself by detection which were the stables, which the mews, where were the cow buyers, the armory, the lofts, the well, the smithy, the kennel, the soldiers' quarters, the priest's room, and my lord's and ladies' chambers, then it will all grow about you again. The little people they were much smaller than we are, and it would be a job for most of us to get inside the few bits of their armor, and old gloves that remain will hurry about in the sunshine, the sheep will ba as they always did, and perhaps from Wales there will come the FFFF pot of the triple feathered arrow, which looks as if it had never moved. This place was of course, a complete paradise for a boy to be in. The wart ran about it like a rabbit in its own complicated labyrinth. He knew everything, everywhere, all the special smells, good climbs, soft lairs, secret hiding places, jumps, slides, nooks, larders and blisses. For every season he had the best place like a cat and he yelled and ran and fought and upset people, and snoozed and daydreamed, and pretended he was a knight, without ever stopping. Just now he was in the kennel. People in those days had rather different ideas about the training of dogs to what we have today. They did it more by love than strictness. Imagine a modern MFH going to bed with his hounds, and yet Flavius Ariana says that it is best of all, if they can sleep with a person, because it makes them more human, and because they rejoice in the company of human beings. Also, if they have had a restless night or been internally upset, you will know of it, and will not use them to hunt next day. In Sir Ector's kennel there was a special boy, called the Dog Boy, who lived with the hounds day and night. He was a sort of head hound and it was his business to take them out every day for walks, to pull thorns out of their feet, keep cankers out of their ears, bind the smaller bones that got dislocated, dose them for worms, isolate and nurse them into distemper, arbitrate in their quarrels and sleep curled up among them at night. If one more learned quotation may be excused, this is how the Duke of York who was killed at Agincourt described such a boy in his master of game. Also, I will teach the child to let out the hounds to scumber twice in the day in the morning and in the evening, so that the sun be up, especially in winter. Then should he let them run and play long in a meadow in the sun, and then comb every hound after the other, and wipe them with a great wisp of straw, and this he shall do every morning. And then he shall lead them into some fair place where tender grass grows as corn and other things, that therewith they may feed themselves, as if it is medicine for them. Thus, since the boy's heart and his business be with the hounds, the hounds themselves become goodly and kindly and clean, glad and joyful and playful, and goodly to all manner of folks save to the wild beasts to whom they should be fierce, eager and spiteful. 
Sir Ector's dog boy was none other than the one who had had his nose bitten off by the terrible Watt. Not having a nose like a human, and being, moreover, subjected to stone throwing by the other village children, he had become more comfortable with animals. He talked to them, not in baby talk like a maiden lady, but correctly in their own growls and barks. They all loved him very much, and revered him for taking thorns out of their toes, and came to him with their little troubles at once. He always understood immediately what was wrong, and generally he could put it right. It was nice for the dogs to have their god with them, in visible form. The wart was fond of the dog boy, and thought him very clever to be able to do all these things with animals, for he could make them do almost anything just by moving his hands while the dog boy loved the wart in much the same way as his dogs loved him, and thought the wart was almost holy, because he could read and write. They spent much of their time together rolling about with the dogs in the kennel. The kennel was on the ground floor, near the mews with a loft above it, so that it should be cool in summer and warm in winter. The hounds were Alon's, Gay's hounds, Limers and Bratches. They were called Clumsy, Trounier, Phoebe, Call, Gerland, Talbot, Luab, Lufra, Apollon, Orthros, Bran, Jellert, Bounce, Boy, Lion, Bungie, Toby and Diamond. The wart's own special one was called Cavill, and he happened to be licking Cavill's nose, not the other way about when Merlin came in and found him. That will come to be regarded as an insanitary habit said Merlin, though I can't see it myself. After all, God made the creature's nose just as well as he made your tongue. If not better added the philosopher pensively. The wart did not know what Merlin was talking about, but he liked him to talk. He did not like the grown-ups who talked down to him like a baby, but the ones who just went on talking in their usual way, leaving him to leap along in their wake, jumping at meanings, guessing, clutching at known words, and chuckling at complicated jokes as they suddenly dawned. He had the glee of the porpoise then, pouring and leaping through strange seas. Shall we go out? asked Merlin. I think it is about time we began our lessons. The wart's heart sank at this. His tutor had been there a month, and it was now August, but they had done no lessons so far. Now he suddenly remembered that this was what Merlin was for, and he thought with dread of Samuli Logicales and the filthy astrolabe. He knew that it had to be born, however, and got up obediently enough, after giving Cavill a last reluctant pat. He thought that it might not be so bad with Merlin, who might be able to make even the old organ an interesting, particularly if he would do some magic. They went out into the courtyard, into a sun so burning that the heat of haymaking seemed to have been nothing. It was baking. The thunder clouds which usually go with hot weather were there, high columns of cumulus with glaring edges, but there was not going to be any thunder. It was too hot even for that. If only thought the wart, I did not have to go into a stuffy classroom, but could take off my clothes and swim in the moat. They crossed the courtyard, having almost to take deep breaths before they darted across it, as if they were going quickly through an oven. The shade of the gatehouse was cool, but the barbican, with its close walls, was hottest of all. In one last dash across the desert they had achieved the drawbridge could Merlin have guessed what he was thinking about, and were staring down into the moat. It was the season of water lilies. If Sir Ector had not kept one section free of them for the boys bathing, all the water would have been covered. As it was, about 20 yards on each side of the bridge were cut each year, and you could dive in from the bridge itself. The moat was quite deep. It was used as a stew, so that the inhabitants of the castle could have fish on Fridays, and for this reason the architects had been careful not to let the drains and sewers run into it. It was stocked with fish every year. I wish I was a fish said the wart. What sort of fish? It was almost too hot to think about this. But the wart stared down into the cool amber depths where a school of small perch were aimlessly hanging about. I think I should like to be a perch, he said. 
They are braver than the silly roach and not quite so slaughterous as the pike. Merlin took off his hat, raised his staff of lignum vitae politely in the air, and said slowly, Snilerum snamilpmakadinepindna liweilnikt pekasit yabsa ashif. Immediately there was a loud blowing of seashells, conches and so forth, and a stout, jolly-looking gentleman appeared seated on a well-blown-up cloud above the battlements. He had an anchor tattooed on his tummy and a handsome mermaid with Mabel written under her on his chest. He ejected a quid of tobacco, nodded affably to Merlin, and pointed his trident at the wart. The wart found he had no clothes on. He found that he had tumbled off the drawbridge, landing with a smack on his side in the water. He found that the moat and the bridge had grown hundreds of times bigger. He knew that he was turning into a fish. Oh, Merlin cried the wart. Please come to. Just for this once said the large and solemn tench beside his ear, I will come, but in future you will have to go by yourself. Education is experience, and the essence of experience is self-reliance. The wart found it difficult to be a fish, it was no good trying to swim like a human being, for it made him go corkscrew and much too slowly. He did not know how to swim like a fish, not like that said the tension in ponderous tones. Put your chin on your left shoulder and do jackknives, never mind about the fins to begin with. The wart's legs had fused together into his backbone, and his feet and toes had become a tail fin. His arms had become two more fins also of a delicate pinkish color, and he had sprouted some more somewhere about his tummy. His head faced over his shoulder, so that when he bent in the middle, his toes were moving towards his ear, instead of towards his forehead. He was a beautiful olive green collar with rather scratchy plaid armor all over him, and dark bands down his sides. He was not sure which were his sides and which were his back and front, but what now appeared to be his tummy had an attractive whitish collar, while his back was armed with a splendid great fin that could be erected for war and had spikes in it. He did jackknives as the tench directed and found that he was swimming vertically downwards into the mud. Use your feet to turn to left or right, with said the tench, and spread those fins on your tummy to keep level. You are living in two planes now, not one. The wart found that he could keep more or less level by altering the inclination of his arm fins and the ones on his stomach. He swam feebly off, enjoying himself very much. Come back, said the tench solemnly. You must learn to swim before you can dart. The wart turned to his tutor in a series of zigzags and remarked, I don't seem to keep quite straight. The trouble with you is that you don't swim from the shoulder. You swim as if you were a boy just bending at the hips. Try doing your jackknives right from the neck downwards and move your body exactly the same amount to the right as you are going to move it to the left. Put your back into it. Wart gave two terrific kicks and vanished altogether in a clump of mare's tail several yards away. That's better said the tench, now quite out of sight in the murky olive water, and the wart backed himself out of his tangle with infinite trouble. By wriggling his arm fins, he undulated back towards the voice in one terrific shove to show off. Good said the tench as they collided end to end, but discretion is the better part of valor. Try if you can do this one said the tench. Without apparent exertion of any kind he swam off backwards under a water lily. Without apparent exertion, but the wart, who was an enterprising learner, had been watching the slightest movement of his fins. He moved his own fins anti-clockwise, gave the very tip of his own tail a cunning flick, and was lying alongside the tench. Splendid said Merlin. Let's go for a little swim. The wart was on an even keel now, and reasonably able to move about. He had leisure to observe the extraordinary universe into which the tattooed gentleman's trident had plunged him. It was very different from the universe to which he had hitherto been accustomed. For one thing, the heaven or sky above him was now a perfect circle poised a few inches above his head. 
the horizon had closed into this. In order to imagine yourself into the ward's position, you will have to picture a round horizon a few inches above your head instead of the flat horizon which you have usually seen. Under this horizon of air you will have to imagine another horizon underwater, spherical and practically upside down for the surface of the water acted partly as a mirror to what was below it. It is difficult to imagine. What makes it a great deal more difficult to imagine is that everything which human beings would consider to be above the water level was fringed with all the colors of the spectrum. For instance, if you had happened to be fishing for the wart, he would have seen you, at the rim of the tea saucer, which was the upper air to him, not as one person waving a fishing rod, but as seven people whose outlines were red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet, all waving the same rod whose colors were as varied. In fact, you would have been a rainbow man to him, a beacon of flashing and radiating colors, which ran into one another, and had rays all about. You would have been burnt upon the water like Cleopatra in the poem by Heredia, the reference may possibly be to Shakespeare. The next most lovely thing was that the wart had no weight. He was not earthbound anymore and did not have to plod along on a flat surface, pressed down by gravity and the weight of the atmosphere. He could do what men have always wanted to do, that is, fly. There is practically no difference between flying in the water and flying in the air. The best of it was that he did not have to fly in a machine by pulling levers and sitting still, but could do it with his own body. It was like the dreams people have. Just as they were going to swim off their tour of inspection, a timid young roach appeared from between two waving bottle brushes of mare's tail and hung about, looking quite pale with agitation. It looked at them with big apprehensive eyes and evidently wanted something but could not make up its mind. Approach said Merlin gravely. At this the roach rushed up like a hen, burst into tears and began stammering its message. If you pee 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 please doctor stammered the poor creature, gabbling, so that they could scarcely understand what it said, we have such a deed dreadful case of SSS something or other in our family, and we www wondered if you could SSS spare the time? It's our DDD dear mama, who WWW will swim uh, all the time upside DDD down, and she DDD does look so horrible and SSS speaks so strange that we RRR really thought she ought to have a DDD doctor. If it WWW wouldn't be too much, CCC Clara says to say so, sir. If you SSSC WWW, what I MMM mean? Here the little roach began fizzing so much, what with its stammer and its tearful disposition, that it became perfectly inarticulate and could only stare at Merlin with big mournful eyes. Never mind, my little nan said Merlin. There, there, lead me to your poor mama, and we shall see what we can do. They all three swam off into the murk under the drawbridge upon their errand of mercy. Very Russian, these roach whispered Merlin to the wart, behind his fin. It's probably only a case of nervous hysteria, a matter for the psychologist rather than the physician. The roach's mama was lying on her back as he had described. She was squinting horribly, had folded her fins upon her chest, and every now and then she blew a bubble. All her children were gathered round her in a circle, and every time she blew a bubble, they all nudged each other and gasped. She had a seraphic smile upon her face. Well, well, well said Merlin, putting on his best bedside manner, and how is Mrs. Roach today? He patted all the young roaches on the head and advanced with stately motions towards his patient. It should perhaps be mentioned that Merlin was a ponderous, deep beamed fish of about five pounds, red leather colored, with small scales, adipus in his fins, rather slimy, and having a bright marigold eye a respectable figure. Mrs. Roach held out a languid fin, sighed emphatically and said, Ah, doctor, so you've come at last? Hum said Merlin in his deepest tones. Then he told everybody to close their eyes, the wart peeped, 
and began to swim round the invalid in a slow and stately dance. As he danced he sang. His song was this, therapeutic, elephantic, diagnosis, boom, pancreatic, microstatic, antitoxic, doom, with normal catabolism, gabalism and babalism, snip, snap, snorum, cut out as abdonorum, dyspepsia, anemia, toxemia, one, two, three, and out goes he, with a full D roll Dorito for the five guinea fee. At the end of his song he was swimming round his patient so close that he actually touched her, stroking his brown smooth scaled flanks against her more ratly pale ones. Perhaps he was healing her with slime for all fishes are said to go to the tench for medicine, or perhaps it was by touch or massage or hypnotism. In any case, Mrs. Roach suddenly stopped squinting, turned the right way up, and said, Oh, doctor, dear doctor. I feel I could eat a little lobworm now. No lobworm, said Merlin, not for two days. I shall give you a prescription for a strong broth of algae every two hours, Mrs. Roach. We must build up your strength, you know. After all, Rome wasn't built in a day. Then he patted all the little roaches once more, told them to grow up into brave little fish, and swam off with an air of great importance into the gloom. As he swam, he puffed his mouth in and out. What did you mean by that about Rome? asked the wart when they were out of earshot. Heaven knows, said the tench. They swam along, Merlin occasionally advising him to put his back into it when he forgot, and all the strange underwater world began to dawn about them, deliciously cool after the heat of the upper air. The great forests of the weed were delicately traced, and in them there hung motionless many schools of sticklebacks, learning to do their physical exercises in strict unison. On the word one they all lay still. At two they faced about, at three they all shot together into a cone, whose apex was a bit of something to eat. Water snails slowly ambled about on the stems of the lilies or under their leaves, while fresh water mussels lay on the bottom doing nothing in particular. Their flesh was salmon pink, like a very good strawberry cream ice. The small congregations of perch it was a strange thing, but all the bigger fish seemed to have hidden themselves, had delicate circulations, so that they blushed or grew pale as easily as a lady in a Victorian novel. Only their blush was a deep olive color, and it was the blush of rage. Whenever Merlin and his companions swam past them, they raised their spiky dorsal fins in menace, and only lowered them when they saw that Merlin was a tench. The black bars on their sides made them look as if they had been grilled, and these also could become darker or lighter. Once the two travelers passed under a swan, the white creature floated above like a zeppelin, all indistinct, except what was under the water. The latter part was quite clear and showed that the swan was floating slightly on one side with one leg cocked up over its back. Look, said the wart, it's the poor swan with the deformed leg. It can only paddle with one leg and the other side of it is all hunched. Nonsense, said the swan snappily, putting its head into the water and giving them a frown with its black nares. Swans like to rest in this position and you can keep your fishy sympathy to yourself, so there. It continued to glare at them from up above, like a white snake suddenly let down through the ceiling until they were out of sight. You swim along said the tench in gloomy tones, as if there was nothing to be afraid of in the world. Don't you see that this place is exactly like the forest you had to come through to find me, is it? Look over there. The wart looked and at first saw nothing. Then he saw a little translucent shape hanging motionless near the surface. It was just outside the shadow of a water lily and was evidently enjoying the sun. It was a baby pike, absolutely rigid and probably asleep, and it looked like a pipe stem or a seahorse stretched out flat. It would be a brigand when it grew up. I am taking you to see one of those said the tench, the emperor of all these purlieus. As a doctor I have immunity, and I dare say he will respect you as my companion as well. 
But you had better keep your tail bent in case he is feeling tyrannical. Is he the king of the moat? He is the king of the moat, old Jack they call him, and some Black Peter, but for the most part, they don't mention him by name at all, they just call him Mr. N. You will see what it is to be a king. The work began to hang behind his conductor a little and perhaps it was as well that he did, for they were almost on top of their destination before he noticed it. When he did see the old despot he started back in horror, for Mr. M was four feet long, his weight incalculable. The great body, shadowy and almost invisible among the stems, ended in a face which had been ravaged by all the passions of an absolute monarch, by cruelty, sorrow, age, pride, selfishness, loneliness and thought too strong for individual brains. There he hung or hoved his vast ironic mouth permanently drawn downwards in a kind of melancholy, his lean clean-shaven chops, giving him an American expression, like that of Uncle Sam. He was remorseless, disillusioned, logical, predatory, fierce, pitiless. But his great jewel of an eye was that of a stricken deer, large, fearful, sensitive and full of griefs. He made no movement whatever, but looked upon them with this bitter eye. The wart thought to himself that he did not care for Mr. M. Lord said Merlin, not paying any attention to his nervousness. I have brought a young professor who would learn to profess. To profess what? Inquired the king of the moat slowly, hardly opening his jaws and speaking through his nose. Power said the tench. Let him speak for himself. Please said the wart, I don't know what I ought to ask. There is nothing, said the monarch, except the power that you profess to seek. Power to grind and power to digest, power to seek and power to find, power to await and power to claim, all power and pitilessness springing from the nape of the neck. Thank you, said the wart. Love is a trick played on us by the forces of evolution, continued the monster monotonously. Pleasure is the bait laid down by the same. There is only power. Power is of the individual mind, but the mind's power alone is not enough. The power of strength decides everything in the end, and only might is right. Now I think it is time that you should go away, young master, for I find this conversation excessively exhausting. I think you ought to go away really almost at once, in case my great disillusioned mouth should suddenly determine to introduce you to my great gills, which have teeth in them also. Yes, I really think you ought to go away this moment. Indeed, I think you ought to put your very back into it. And so, a long farewell to all my greatness. The ward had found himself quite hypnotized by all these long words, and hardly noticed that the thin lip tight mouth was coming closer and closer to him all the time. It came imperceptibly, as the cold suave words distracted his attention, and suddenly it was looming within an inch of his nose. On the last sentence it opened, horrible and vast, the thin skin stretching ravenously from bone to bone and tooth to tooth. Inside there seemed to be nothing but teeth, sharp teeth like thorns in rows and ridges everywhere, like the nails in laborers' boots, and it was only at the very last second that he was able to regain his own will to pull himself together, recollect his instructions and to escape. All those teeth clashed behind him at the tip of his tail, as he gave the hardiest jackknife he had ever given. In a second he was on dry land once more, standing beside Merlin on the piping drawbridge panting in all his clothes. Chapter 6 one Thursday afternoon the boys were doing their archery as usual. There were two straw targets 50 yards apart, and when they had shot their arrows at the one, they had only to go to it, collect them, and fire back at the other after facing about. It was still the loveliest summer weather, and there had been chickens for dinner, so that Merlin had gone off to the edge of the shooting ground and sat down under a tree. 
What with the warmth and the chickens and the cream he had poured over his pudding, and the continual repassing of the boys, and the talk of the arrows in the targets, which was as sleepy to listen to as the noise of a lawn mower, and the dance of the egg-shaped sunspots between the leaves of his tree, the aged magician was soon fast asleep. Archery was a serious occupation in those days. It had not yet been relegated to red Indians and small boys, so that when you were shooting badly, you got into a bad temper, just as the wealthy pheasant shooters do today. Kay was shooting badly. He was trying too hard and plucking on his loose, instead of leaving it to the bow. Oh, come on, said Kay. I'm sick of these beastly targets. Let's have a shot at the Papinje. They left the targets and had several shots at the Papinje, which was a large, bright-colored artificial bird stuck on the top of a stick, like a parrot, and Kay missed these also. First he had a feeling of, well, I will hit the filthy thing, even if I have to go without my tea until I do it, then he nearly became bored. The wart said, let's play rovers then, we can come back in half an hour and wake Merlin up. What they called rovers consisted of going for a walk with their bows and shooting one arrow each at any agreed mark which they came across. Sometimes it would be a mole hill, sometimes a clump of rushes, sometimes a big thistle almost at their feet. They varied the distance at which they chose these objects, sometimes picking a target as much as 120 yards away, which was about as far as these boys' bows could carry, and sometimes having to aim actually below a close thistle, because the arrow always leaps up a foot or two, as it leaves the bow. They counted five for a hit, and one if the arrow was within a bow's length, and added up their scores at the end. On this Thursday they chose their targets wisely and besides, the grass of the big field had been lately cut, so they never had to search for their arrows for long, which nearly always happens, as in golf, if you shoot ill-advisedly near the hedges or in rough places. The result was that they strayed further than usual and found themselves near the edge of the savage forest where Kali had been lost. I both said Kay that we go to those berries in the chase and see if we can get a rabbit. It would be more fun than shooting at these hummocks. They did this. They chose two trees about a hundred yards apart, and each boy stood under one of them, waiting for the conies to come out again. They stood very still, with their bows already raised and arrows fitted, so that they would make the least possible movement to disturb the creatures when they did appear. It was not difficult for either of them to stand thus, for the very first test which they had had to pass in archery was standing with the bow at arm's length for half an hour. They had six arrows each, and would be able to fire and mark them all, before they needed to frighten the rabbits back by walking about to collect. An arrow does not make enough noise to upset more than the particular rabbit that it is shot at. At the fifth shot K was lucky, he allowed just the right amount for wind and distance, and his point took a young coney square in the head. It had been standing up on end to look at him, wondering what he was. Oh, well shot, cried the wart as they ran to pick it up. It was the first rabbit they had ever hit, and luckily they had killed it dead. When they had carefully gutted it with the little hunting knife which Merlin had given in order to keep it fresh, and passed one of its hind legs through the other at the hawk for convenience in carrying, the two boys prepared to go home with their prize. But before they unstrung their bows they used to observe a ceremony. Every Thursday afternoon, after the last serious arrow had been fired, they were allowed to fit one more knot to their strings, and to discharge the arrow straight up in the air. It was partly a gesture of farewell, partly of triumph, and it was beautiful. They did it now as a salute to their first prey. 
The wart watched his arrow go up. The sun was already westing towards evening, and the trees where they were had plunged them into a partial shade. So, as the arrow topped the trees and climbed into sunlight, it began to burn against the evening like the sun itself. Up and up it went, not weaving as it would have done with a snatching loose, but soaring, swimming, aspiring towards heaven, steady, golden and superb. Just as it had spent its force, just as its ambition had been dimmed by destiny, and it was preparing to faint to turn over, to pour back into the bosom of its mother earth, a terrible portent happened. A gore crow came flapping wearily before the approaching night. It came, it did not waver, it took the arrow, it flew away, heavy and hoisting, with the arrow in its beak. Kay was frightened by this. But the wart was furious. He had loved his arrow's movement, its burning ambition in the sunlight, and besides it was his best arrow. It was the only one which was perfectly balanced, sharp tight feathered clean knocked, and neither warped nor scraped. It was a witch said K. I don't care if it was ten witches said the wart. I am going to get it back. But it went towards the forest. I shall go after it. You can go alone, then said Kay, I'm not going into the forest savage just for a putrid arrow, I shall go alone, oh, well said Kay, I suppose I shall have to come too, if you're so set on it, and I bet we shall get nobbled by what, let a nobble said the wart, I want my arrow, they went in the forest at the place where they had last seen the bird of carrion. In less than five minutes, they were in a clearing with a well and a cottage just like Merlin's. Goodness said Kay, I never knew there were any cottages so close. I say, let's go back. I just want to look at this place said the wart, it's probably a wizard's. The cottage had a brass plate screwed on the garden gate. It said, Madam Mim B A Dom Daniel, Pianofort, Needlework, Necromancy. No hawkers, circulars or income tax, beware of the dragon, the cottage had lace curtains, these stirred ever so slightly, for behind them there was a lady peeping, the gore crow was standing on the chimney, come on said Kay, oh, do come on, I tell you, she'll never give it back. At this point the door of the cottage opened suddenly, and the witch was revealed standing in the passage. She was a strikingly beautiful woman of about 30, with coal black hair so rich that it had the blue black of the maggot pies in it. Sky bright eyes and a general soft air of butter wouldn't melt in my mouth. She was sly. How do you do, my dear said Madam Mim. And what can I do for you today? The boys took off their leather caps, and Wart said, Please, there is a crow sitting on your chimney, and I think it has stolen one of my arrows. Precisely said Madam Min. I have the arrow within. Could I have it back, please? Inevitably said Madam Min. The young gentleman shall have his arrow on the very instant, in four ticks, and ere the bat squeaks thrice. Thank you very much said the Wart. Step forward said Madam Min, honor the threshold, accept the humble hospitality in the spirit in which it is given. I really do not think we can stay said the wart politely, I really think we must go, we shall be expected back at home. Sweet expectation replied Madam Min in devout tones. Yet you would have thought she added that the young gentleman could have found time to honor a poor cottager out of politeness. Few can believe how we ignoble tenants of the lower classes value a visit from the landlord's sons. We would like to come in said the wart very much. But you see we shall be late already. The lady now began to give a sort of simpering whine. The fare is lowly she said. No doubt it is not what you would be accustomed to eating, and so naturally such highly born ones would not care to partake. Kay's strongly developed feeling for good form gave way at this. He was an aristocratic boy always and condescended to his inferiors so that they could admire him. Even at the risk of visiting a witch, he was not going to have it said that he had refused to eat a tenant's food because it was too humble. 
Come on, Wart, he said. We needn't be back before Vespers. Madame Mim swept them a low curtsy as they crossed the threshold. Then she took them each by the scruff of the neck, lifted them right off the ground with her strong gypsy arms, and shot out of the back door with them almost before they had got in at the front. The Wart caught a hurried glimpse of her parlor and kitchen. The lace curtains, the aspidistra. The lithograph called the Virgin's Chois, the printed text of the Lord's Prayer, written backwards and hung upside down, the seashell, the needle case in the shape of a heart with a present from Camelot written on it, the broomsticks, the cauldrons, and the bottles of dandelion wine. Then they were kicking and struggling in the backyard. We thought that the growing sportsmen would care to examine our rabbits, said Madame Min. There was indeed a row of large rabbit hutches in front of them, but they were empty of rabbits. In one hutch there was a poor ragged old eagle owl, evidently quite miserable and neglected. In another a small boy unknown to them, a whittle who could only roll his eyes and burble when the witch came near. In a third there was a molting black cock. A fourth had a mangy goat in it, also black, and two more stood empty. Grizzle Greedigates cried the witch. Here, mother answered the carrion crow. With a flop and a squawk it was sitting beside them, its hairy black beak cocked on one side. It was the witch's familiar. Open the doors commanded Madam Mim, and Greedigates shall have eyes for supper, round and blue. The gore crow hastened to obey, with every sign of satisfaction, and pulled back the heavy doors in its strong beak with three times three. Then the two boys were thrust inside, one into each hutch, and Madame Min regarded them with unmixed pleasure. The doors had magic locks on them, and the witch had made them to open by whispering in their keyholes. As nice a brace of young gentlemen said the witch, as ever stewed or roasted, fattened on real butcher's meat, I dare say, with milk and all. Now we'll have the big one jugged for Sunday, if I can get a bit of wine to go in the pot, and the little one we'll have on the moon's morn, by jing and by gee, for how can I keep my sharp fork out of him a minute longer it fair gives me the croup. Let me out said Kay hoarsely, you old witch, or Sir Ector will come for you. At this Madame Min could no longer contain her joy. Hark to the little varmint she cried, snapping her fingers and doing a bouncing jig before the cages. Hark to the sweet, audacious, tender little veal. He answers back and threatens us with Sir Ector, on the very brink of the pot. That's how I faint to tooth them, I do declare, and that's how I will tooth them ere the week be out, by Scarmiglian, Belial Peer, Siriato Sanudo and Dr. D. With this she began bustling about in the backyard, the herb garden and the scullery cleaning pots, gathering plants for the stuffing, sharpening knives and cleavers, boiling water, skipping for joy, licking her greedy lips, saying spells, braiding her night black hair, and singing as she worked. First she sang the old witch's song, black spirits and white, red spirits and gray. Mingle, 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 you that mingle may. Here's the blood of a bat, put in that, oh, put in that. Here's Libert's bane, put in again. Mingle, 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 you that mingle may. Then she sang her work song. Two spoons of sherry, three ounces of yeast, half a pound of unicorn. And, God bless the feast, shake them in the colander, band them to a chop. Simmer slightly, snip up nicely, jump, skip, hop, knit one, knot one, purl two together, pip one and pop one and pluck the secret, feather, baste in a mod, oven, God bless our coven, tra la la, three toads in a jar, tee hee hee, put in the frog's knee, peep out of the lace curtain, there goes the top lady girl, she's up to, no good that's certain, Oh, what a lovely baby, how nice it would go with gravy, pinch the salt, here she pinched it very nastily, turn the malt, here she began twiddling round widdershins in a vulgar way, with a hey na 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 and I don't mean maybe, 
At the end of this song, Madame Mim took a sentimental turn and delivered herself of several hymns of a blasphemous nature and of a tender love lyric which she sang sotto voce with trills. It was, my love is like a red, red nose, his tail is soft and tawny, and everywhere my lovely goes, I call him Nickerhorny. She vanished into the parlor to lay the table. Poor Kay was weeping in the corner of the end hutch, lying on his face and paying no attention to anything. Before Madame Min had finally thrown him in, she had pinched him all over to see if he was fat. She had also slapped him to see, as the butchers put it, if he was hollow. On top of this, he did not in the least want to be eaten for Sunday dinner, and he was miserably furious with the wart for leading him into such a terrible doom on account of a mere arrow. He had forgotten that it was he who had insisted on entering the fatal cottage. The wart sat on his haunches because the cage was too small for standing up and examine his prison. The bars were of iron and the gate was iron too. He shook all the bars, one after the other, but they were as firm as rock. There was an iron bowl for water with no water in it, and some old straw in a corner for lying down. It was verminous. Our mistress said the mangy old goat suddenly from the next pen is not very careful of her pets. He spoke in a low voice so that nobody could hear, but the carrion crow which had been left on the chimney to spy on them noticed that they were talking and moved nearer. Whisper said the goat, if you want to talk, are you one of her familiars? asked the wart suspiciously. The poor creature did not take offense at this and tried not to look hurt. No, he said, I'm not a familiar. I'm only a mangy old black goat, rather tattered as you see, and kept for sacrifice. Will she eat you too? asked the wart, rather tremblingly. Not she. I shall be too rank for her sweet tooth, you may be sure. No, she will use my blood for making patterns with on Wolpurgis night. It's quite a long way off, you know continued the goat without self-pity. For myself I don't mind very much, for I am old. But look at that poor owl there, that she keeps merely for a sense of possession and generally forgets to feed. That makes my blood boil, that does. It wants to fly to stretch its wings. At night it just runs round and round and round like a big rat, it gets so restless. Look, it has broken all its soft feathers. For me, it doesn't matter, for I'm naturally of a sedentary disposition now that youth has flown, but I call that owl a rare shame. Something ought to be done about it. The wart knew that he was probably going to be killed that night, the first to be released out of all that band, but yet he could not help feeling touched at the grief-heartedness of this goat. Itself under sentence of death, it could afford to feel strongly about the owl. He wished he were as brave as this. If only I could get out said the wart. I know a magician who would soon settle her hash and rescue us all. The goat thought about this for some time, nodding its gentle old head with the great Karingram eyes. Then it said, as a matter of fact I know how to get you out, only I did not like to mention it before. Put your ear nearer the bars. I know how to get you out, but not your poor friend there who is crying. I didn't like to subject you to a temptation like that. You see when she whispers to the lock I have heard what she says, but only at the locks on either side of mine. When she gets a cage away she is too soft to be heard. I know the words to release both you and me, and the black cock here too, but not your young friend yonder. Why ever haven't you let yourself out before? Asked the wart, his heart beginning to bound. I can't speak them in human speech, you see, said the goat sadly, and this poor mad boy here, the whittle, he can't speak them either. Ah, um, tell me then. You will be safe then, and so would I and the cock be too, if you stayed long enough to let us out. But would you be brave enough to stay? Or would you run at once? And what about your friend and the whittle and the old owl? I should run for Merlin at once said the wart. Oh, at once, and he would come back and kill this old witch in two twos, and then we should all be out. 
The goat looked at him deeply, his tired old eyes seeming to ask their way kindly into the bottom of his heart. I shall tell you only the words for your own luck said the goat at last. The cock and I will stay here with your friend as hostages for your return. Oh, goat whispered the wart. You could have made me say the words to get you out first, and then gone your way. Or you could have got the three of us out, starting with yourself to make sure, and left K to be eaten. But you are staying with K. Oh, goat, I will never forget you. And if I do not get back in time, I shall not be able to bear my life. We shall have to wait till dark. It will only be a few minutes now. As the goat spoke, they could see Madame Mim lighting the oil lamp in the parlor. It had a pink glass shade with patterns on it. The crow, which could not see in the dark came quietly closer, so that at least he ought to be able to hear. Goat said the wart, in whose heart something strange and terrible had been going on in the dangerous twilight, put your head closer still. Please, goat, I am not trying to be better than you are, but I have a plan. I think it is I who had better stay as hostage and you who had better go. You are black and will not be seen in the night. You have four legs and can run much faster than I. Let you go with a message for Merlin. I will whisper you out and I will stay. He was hardly able to say the last sentence, for he knew that Madame Mim might come for him at any moment now. And if she came before Merlin, it would be his death warrant. But he did say it pushing the words out as if he were breathing against water, for he knew that if he himself were gone when Madame came for him, she would certainly eat Kay at once. Master said the goat without further words, and it put one leg out and laid its double-knobbed forehead on the ground in the salute, which is given to royalty. Then it kissed his hand as a friend. Quick said the wart, give me one of your hoofs through the bars, and I will scratch a message on it with one of my arrows. It was difficult to know what message to write on such a small space with such a clumsy implement. In the end he just wrote K. He did not use his own name because he thought K more important, and that they would come quicker for him. Do you know the way? He asked. My grandam used to live at the castle. What are the words? Mine said the goat, are rather upsetting. What are they? Well said the goat, you must say. Let good digestion wait on appetite. Oh, goat said the ward in a broken voice. How horrible. But run quickly, goat, and come back safely, goat, and oh, goat, give me one more kiss for company before you go. The goat refused to kiss him. It gave him the emperor's salute of both feet and bounded away into the darkness as soon as he had said the words. Unfortunately, although he had whispered too carefully for the crow to hear their speech, the release words had had to be said rather loudly to reach the next door keyhole, and the door had creaked. Mother, mother, screamed the crow, the rabbits are escaping. Instantly Madame Min was framed in the lighted doorway of the kitchen. What is it, my grizzle? She cried. What ails us, my halcyon tit? The rabbits are escaping shrieked the crow again. The witch ran out, but too late to catch the goat or even to see him, and began examining the locks at once by the light of her fingers. She held these up in the air, and a blue flame burnt at the tip of each. One little boy safe counted Madame Mim and sobbing for his dinner. Two little boys safe and neither getting thinner. One mangy goat gone, and who cares a fiddle, for the owl and the cock are left, and the whittle in the middle. Still added Madame Mim, it's a caution how he got out, a proper caution, that it is. He was whispering to the little boy sneak the crow, whispering for the last half hour together. Indeed, said the witch, whispering to the little dinner, hey, and much good may it do him. What about a sage stuffing? boy, hey, and what were you doing, my greedy gits, to let them carry on like that, no dinner for you, my little painted bird of paradise, so you may just flap off to any old tree and roost, oh, mother whined the crow, I was only a doing of my duty, flap off cried madam min, flap off, and go broody if you like, the poor crow hung its head and crept off to the other end of the roof, sneering to itself, 
Now my juicy toothful said the witch turning to the ward and opening his door with the proper whisper of enough is as good as a feast, we think the cauldron simmers and the oven is mod. how will my tender sucking pig enjoy a little popping lard instead of the clandestine whisper? The wart ran about in his cage as much as he could and gave as much trouble as possible in being caught in order to save even a little time for the coming of Merlin. Let go of me, you beast he cried. Let go of me, you foul hag, or I'll bite your fingers. How the creature scratches said Madam Min. Bless us, how he wriggles and kicks just for being a pagan's dinner. Don't you dare kill me cried the wart, now hanging by one leg. Don't you dare lay a finger on me, or you'll be sorry for it. The lamb said Madam Min. The partridge with a plump breast, how he does squeak. And then there's the cruel old custom continued the witch carrying him into the lamplight of the kitchen, where a new sheet was laid on the floor of plucking the poor chicken before it is dead. The feathers come out cleaner so. Nobody could be so cruel as to do it nowadays by nothing or by never. But of course a little boy doesn't feel any pain. Their clothes come off nicer if you take them off alive, and who would dream of roasting a little boy in his clothes to spoil the feast? Murderous cried the wart. You will rue this ere the night is out. Hubeling said the witch, it's a shame to kill him, that it is. Look how his little downy hair stares in the lamplight and how his poor eyes pop out of his head. Greedy Gits will be sorry to miss those eyes, so she will. Sometimes one could almost be a vegetarian when one has to do a deed like this. The witch laid the ward over her lap, with his head between her knees, and carefully began to take his clothes off with a practiced hand. He kicked and squirmed as much as he could, reckoning that every hindrance would put off the time when he would be actually knocked on the head, and thus increase the time in which the black goat could bring Merlin to his rescue. During this time the witch sang her plucking song of, pull the feather with the skin, not against the gray no, pluck the soft one out from in, the great with might and may no, even if he wriggles, never heed his squiggles, for mercifully little boys are quite immune to pain no. she varied this song with the other kitchen song of the happy cook, soft skin for crackling, oh, my lovely duckling, the skewers go here, and the strings go there, and such is my scrumptious suckling. You will be sorry for this cried the wart, even if you live to be a thousand. He has spoken enough said Madam Min. It is time that we knocked him on the napper. Hold him by the legs, and, when up goes his head, clip him with the palm edge, and, then he is dead. The dreadful witch now lifted the wart into the air, and prepared to have her will of him, but at that very moment there was a fizzle of summer lightning without any crash, and in the nick of time Merlin was standing on the threshold. Ha, huh, said Merlin, now we shall see what a double first at Dom Daniel avails against the private education of my master Blias. Madam Min put the wart down without looking at him, rose from her chair, and drew herself to her full magnificent height. Her glorious hair began to crackle, and sparks shot out of her flashing eyes. She and Merlin stood facing each other for fully 60 seconds without a word spoken, and then Madame Min swept a royal curtsy, and Merlin bowed a frigid bow. He stood aside to let her go first out of the doorway, and then followed her into the garden. It ought perhaps to be explained, before we go any further, that in those far-off days, when there was actually a college for witches and warlocks under the sea at Dom Daniel, and when all wizards were either black or white, there was a good deal of ill-feeling between the different creeds. Quarrels between white and black were settled ceremonially, by means of duels. A wizard's duel was run like this. The two principals would stand opposite each other in some large space free from obstructions and await the signal to begin. When the signal was given they were at liberty to turn themselves into things. It was rather like the game that can be played by two people with their fists. 
They say one, two, three, and at three, they either stick out two fingers for scissors, or the flat palm for paper, or the clenched fist for stone. If your hand becomes paper when your opponent's becomes scissors, then he cuts you and wins. But if yours had turned into stone, his scissors are blunted, and the win is yours. The object of the wizard in the duel was to turn himself into some kind of animal, vegetable or mineral, which would destroy the particular animal, vegetable or mineral, which had been selected by his opponent. Sometimes it went on for hours. Merlin had Archimedes for his second, Madame Min had the Gore Crow for hers, while he Kate, who always had to be present at these affairs in order to keep them regular, sat on the top of a step ladder in the middle to umpire. She was a cold, shining, muscular lady, the color of moonlight. Merlin and Madame Min rolled up their sleeves, gave their surcoats to Hecate to hold, and the latter put on a celluloid eye shade to watch the battle. At the first gong Madame Min immediately turned herself into a dragon. It was the accepted opening move, and Merlin ought to have replied by being a thunderstorm or something like that. Instead he caused a great deal of preliminary confusion by becoming a field mouse, which was quite invisible in the grass, and nibbled Madame Min's tail, as she stared about in all directions for about five minutes before she noticed him. But when she did notice the nibbling, she was a furious cat in two flicks. Wart held his breath to see what the mouse would become next he thought perhaps a tiger which could kill the cat, but Merlin merely became another cat. He stood opposite her and made faces. This most irregular procedure put Madame Mim quite out of her stride, and it took her more than a minute to regain her bearings and become a dog. Even as she became it, Merlin was another dog standing opposite her of the same sort. Oh, well played sir, cried the wart, beginning to see the plan. Madame Min was furious. She felt herself out of her depth against these unusual stonewalling tactics and experienced an internal struggle not to lose her temper. She knew that if she did lose it, she would lose her judgment and the battle as well. She did some quick thinking. If whenever she turned herself into a menacing animal, Merlin was merely going to turn into the same kind, the thing would become either a mere dog fight or stalemate. She had better alter her own tactics and give Merlin a surprise. At this moment the gong went for the end of the first round. The combatants retired into their respective corners, and their seconds cooled them by flapping their wings, while Archimedes gave Merlin a little massage by nibbling with his beak. Second round commanded Hecate. Seconds out of the ring time. Clang went the gong, and the two desperate wizards stood face to face. Madame Mim had gone on plotting during her rest. She had decided to try a new tack by leaving the offensive to Merlin, beginning by assuming a defensive shape herself. She turned into a spreading oak. Merlin stood baffled under the oak for a few seconds. Then he most cheekily and, as it turned out, rashly became a powdery little blue tit, which flew up and sat perkily on Madame Min's branches. You could see the oak boiling with indignation for a moment, but then its rage became icy cold, and the poor little blue tit was sitting, not on an oak, but on a snake. The snake's mouth was open, and the bird was actually perching on its jaws. The jaws clashed together, but only in the nick of time, the bird whizzed off as a gnat into the safe air. Madame Mim had got it on the run, however, and the speed of the contest now became bewildering. The quicker the attacker could assume a form, the less time the fugitive had to think of a form which would elude it, and now the changes were as quick as thought. The gnat was scarcely in the air when the snake had turned into a toad, whose curious tongue, rooted at the front instead of the back of the jaw, was already unrolling in the flick which would snap it in. The gnat, flustered by the sore pursuit, was bounced into an offensive roll 
and the hard-pressed Merlin now stood before the toad in the shape of a Molin which could attack it, but Madame Mim was in her element, the game was going according to the normal rules now, and in less than an eye's blink, the toad had turned into a peregrine falcon, which was diving at 250 miles an hour upon the heron's back. Poor Merlin, beginning to lose his nerve turned wildly into an elephant, this move usually won a little breathing space, but Madame Mim, relentless, changed from the falcon into an ale on the instant, an ale was as much bigger than an elephant as an elephant is larger than a sheep, it was a sort of horse with an elephant's trunk. Madame Min raised this trunk into the air, gave a shriek like a railway engine, and rushed upon her panting foe. In a flick Merlin had disappeared. One said he Kate. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But before the fatal ten which would have counted him out Merlin reappeared in a bed of nettles, mopping his brow. He had been standing among them as a nettle. The Ali saw no reason to change its shape, it rushed upon the man before it with another piercing scream. Merlin vanished again just as the thrashing trunk descended and all stood still a moment, looking about them, wondering where he would step out next. One began he Kate again, but even as she proceeded with her counting, strange things began to happen. The Ale got hiccoughs, turned red, swelled visibly, began whooping, came out in spots, staggered three times, rolled its eyes, fell rumbling to the ground. It groaned, kicked and said farewell. The wart cheered, Archimedes hooted till he cried, the gore crow fell down dead and he Kate, on the top of her ladder, clapped so much that she nearly tumbled off. It was a master stroke. The ingenious magician had turned himself successively into the microbes, not yet discovered, of hiccoughs, scarlet fever, mumps, whooping cough, measles and heat spots, and from a complication of all these complaints, the infamous Madame Min had immediately expired. Chapter 7. Tilting and horsemanship had two afternoons a week because they were easily the most important branches of a gentleman's education in those days. Merlin grumbled a good deal about athletics, saying that nowadays people seem to think that you were an educated man if you could knock another man off a horse, and that the craze for games was the ruination of true scholarship, nobody got scholarships like they used to do when he was a boy, and all the public schools had been forced to lower their standards, but Sir Ector, who was an old tilting blue, said that the Battle of Cressy had been won upon the playing fields of Camelot. This made Merlin so furious that he gave Sir Ector rheumatism two nights running before he relented. Tilting was a great art and needed an enormous amount of practice. When two knights jousted they held their lances in their right hands, but they directed their horses at one another so that each man had his opponent on his near side. The base of the lance, in fact, was held on the opposite side of the body to the side at which the enemy was charging. This seems rather inside out to anybody who is in the habit, say, of opening gates with a hunting crop but it had its reasons. For one thing, it meant that the shield was on the left arm, so that the opponents charged shield to shield fully covered. It also meant that the man could be unhorsed with the cider edge of the lance in a kind of horizontal swipe, if you did not feel sure of hitting him with your point. This was the humblest or least skillful blow in jousting. A good jouster, like Launcelot or Tristram, always used the blow of the point, because, although it was liable to miss in unskillful hands, it made contact sooner. If one knight charged with his lance held rigidly sideways with a view to sweeping his opponent out of the saddle, the other knight with his lance held directly forward would knock him down a lance length before the sweep came into effect. Then there was how to hold your lance for the point stroke. It was no good crouching in the saddle and clutching it in a rigid grip preparatory to the great shock for if you held it inflexibly like this, its point bucked up and down to every movement of your thundering mount, and you were practically certain to miss your aim. 
On the contrary, you had to sit quite loosely in the saddle with the lance easy and balanced against the horse's motion. It was not until the actual moment of striking that you clamped your knees into the horse's sides, threw your weight forward in your seat, clutched the lance with the whole hand instead of with your finger and thumb, and hugged your right elbow to your side to support its butt. There was the size of spear, obviously a man with a spear 100 yards long would strike down an opponent with a normal spear of 10 or 12 feet before the latter came anywhere near him, but it would have been impossible to make a spear 100 yards long and, if made, impossible to carry. The jouster had to find out the greatest length which he could manage with the greatest speed and stick to that. Sir Launcelot, who came some time after the story, had several sizes of spear and would call for his great spear or his lesser spear as occasion demanded. There were the places on which the enemy should be hit. In the armory of the castle of the forest Savage, there was a big picture of a knight in armor with circles round his vulnerable points. These varied with the style of armor so that you had to study your opponent before the charge and select a point. The good armorers the best lived at Warrington and still live there were careful to make all the forward or entering sides of their suits convex so that the spear point glanced off them. Curiously enough, the shields were more inclined to be concave. It was better that a spear point should stay on your shield rather than glance off upwards or downwards and perhaps hit a more vulnerable point of your body armor. The best place of all for hitting people was on the very crest of the tilting helm, that is, if the person in question were vain enough to have a large metal crest in whose folds and ornaments the point would find a ready lodging. Many were vain enough to have the these armorial crests with bears and dragons or even ships or castles on them. But Sir Launcelot always contented himself with a bear helmet or a bunch of feathers which would not hold spears or, on one occasion, a soft lady's sleeve. It would take too long to go into all the interesting details of proper tilting, which the boys had to learn, for in those days, one had to be a master of one's craft from the bottom upwards. You had to know what wood was best for spears and why, and even how to turn them, so that they would not splinter or warp. There were a thousand disputed questions about arms and armor, all of which had to be understood. Just outside Sir Ector's castle there was a jousting field for tournaments, although there had been no tournaments in it since Kay was born. It was a green meadow kept short, with a broad grassy bank raised around it on which pavilions could be erected. There was an old wooden grandstand at one side, lifted on stilts for the ladies. At present it was only used as a practice ground for tilting, so a quintin had been erected at one end and a ring at the other. The quintin was a very horrible wooden saracen on a pole. He was painted with a bright blue face and red beard and glaring eyes. He had a shield in his left hand and a flat wooden sword in his right. If you hit him in the middle of the forehead all was well. But if your lance struck him on the shield or on any part to left or right of the middle line, then he spun round with great rapidity and usually caught you a wallop with his sword as you galloped by, ducking. His paint was somewhat scratched and the wood picked up over his right eye. The ring was just an ordinary iron ring tied to a kind of gallows by a thread. If you managed to put your point through the ring, the thread broke and you could canter off proudly with the ring round your spear. The day was cooler than it had been for some time, for the autumn was almost within sight, and the two boys were in the tilting yard, with the master armorer and Merlin. The master armorer, or sergeant at arms, was a stiff, pale, bouncy gentleman with waxed mustaches. He always marched about with his chest stuck out like a powder pigeon and called out on the word one on every possible occasion. He took great pains to keep his tummy in and often tripped over his feet because he could not see them over his chest. He was always making his muscles ripple, which annoyed Merlin. 
Wart lay beside Merlin in the shade of the grandstand and scratched himself for harvest bugs. The saw-like sickles had only lately been put away, and the wheat stood in stooks of aid among the tall stubble of those times. The wart still itched. He was also sore about the shoulders and had a burning red ear from making Bosch shots at the Quintin Four. Of course, practice tilting was done without armor. Wart was pleased that it was Kay's turn to go through it now and lay drowsily in the shade, snoozing, scratching, twitching like a dog and partly attending to the fun. Merlin, sitting with his back to all this athleticism, was practicing a spell which he had forgotten. It was a spell to make the sergeant's mustaches uncurl, but at present it only uncurled one of them, and the sergeant had not noticed it. He absentmindedly curled it up again every time that Merlin did the spell, and Merlin said, drat it, and began again. Once he had made the sergeant's ears flap by mistake, and the latter gave a startled look at the sky. How's goat? asked Merlin lazily, getting tired of these activities. They had set free all Madame Mim's poor captives on the night of the great duel, but the goat had insisted on coming home with them. They had found him lurking on the edge of the battleground having galloped all the way back to see the fun and help the ward as best he could if Madame Min should have proved the victor. He has made friend with Cavill said Wart and decided to sleep in the kennels. It was funny at first because Clumsy and Apollon thought it was cheek and tried to run him out. He just stood in a corner so that they could not nip his hawks and gave them such a bunt each with his knobbly forehead that now, whenever he gives them one of his looks, they get up from whatever they are doing and go somewhere else. The dog boy says that Clumsy believes that he is the devil. From far off at the other side of the tilting ground, the sergeant's voice came floating on the still air. Nah, nah, Master K, that ain't it at all. Has you were, has you were. The spear should be held between the thumb and forefinger of the right and with the shield in line with the seam of the trosser leg. The wart rubbed his sore ear and sighed. What are you grieving about now? asked Merlin. I wasn't grieving, I was just thinking. What were you thinking? Oh, it wasn't anything. I was thinking about Kay learning to be a knight. And you may well. Grieve exclaimed Merlin hotly. A lot of brainless unicorns swaggering about and calling themselves educated just because they can push each other off a horse with a bit of stick. It makes me tired. Why, I believe Sir Ector would have been gladder to get a by Our Lady tilting blue for your tutor that swings himself along on his knuckles like an anthropoid ape rather than a magician of known probity and international reputation with first-class honors from every European university. The trouble with the English aristocracy is that they are games mad. That's what it is, games mad. He broke off indignantly and deliberately made the sergeant's ears flap twice in unison. I wasn't thinking quite about that said the wart. As a matter of fact, I was thinking how nice it would be to be a knight like Kay. Well, you'll be one soon enough, won't you? Asked Merlin impatiently. The wart did not answer, won't you? Merlin turned round and looked closely at the wart through his spectacles. What's the matter now? Said Merlin in his nastiest voice. His inspection had showed him that the wart was trying not to cry and that if he spoke in a kind voice, the wart would break down and do it. I shall not be a knight, replied the wart coldly. Merlin's trick had worked, and he no longer wanted to weep. He wanted to kick Merlin. I shall not be a knight because I am not a proper son of Sir Ector's. They will knight Kay, and I shall be his squire. Merlin's back was turned again. But his eyes were twinkling behind his curious spectacles. That's too bad, said Merlin, without any commiseration. The wart burst out with all his thoughts aloud. Oh, he cried, but I should have liked to be born with a proper father and mother, so that I could be a knight errant. What would you have done? I should have had a splendid suit of armor and dozens of spears and a black horse standing 18 hands, and I should have called myself the Black Knight. 
And I should have hoved at a well or a fort or something, and made all true knights, that came that way to joust with me for the honor of their ladies, and I should have spared them all after I had given them a great fall, and I should live out of doors all the year round in a pavilion, and never do anything but joust and go on quests and bear away the prize at tournaments, and I shan't ever tell anybody my name. Your wife won't enjoy the life very much, said Merlin reflectively. Oh, I'm not going to have a wife. I think they're stupid. I shall have to have a lady love, though added the ward uncomfortably, so that I can wear her favor in my helm and do deeds in her honor. A humble bee came zooming between them, under the grandstand and out into the sunlight. Would you like to see some real knights errant? Asked Merlin slowly. Now, for the sake of your education? Oh, I would cried the wart. We've never even had a tournament since I was here. I suppose it could be managed. Oh, please do. You could take me to some like you did to the fish. I suppose it's educational in a way. It's very educational said the wart. I can't think of anything more educational than to see some real knights fighting. Oh, won't you please do it? Do you prefer any particular knights? King Pelliner said the ward immediately. He had a weakness for this gentleman since their strange encounter in the forest savage. Merlin said, that will do very well. Put your hands to your sides and relax your muscles. Cabricius R.C. Thurum, Catalamus, Singulariter, Nominativo, Heat Musa. Shut your eyes and keep them shut. Bonus, Bona, Bonum. Here we go. Deus Sanctus, Est no Ratio Latinas, Etium, Bui, Quer, Perquoi, Quia Substantivo et Ejectivum Concordat Generi, Numrum et Casus. Here we are. While this incantation was going on, Ward experienced some queer sensations. First he could hear the sergeant calling out to Kay. Nah then, nah then, keep the eels down and swing the body from the ips. Then the words got smaller and smaller, as if he were looking at his feet through the wrong end of a telescope, and began to swirl round into a cone, as if they were at the pointed bottom end of a whirlpool, which was sucking him into the air. There was nothing but a loud rotating roaring and hissing noise, which rose to such a tornado, that he felt he could not stand it anymore. Finally there was utter silence and Merlin saying, here we are. All this happened in about the time that it would take a sixpenny rocket to start off with its fiery swish, bend down from its climax, and disperse itself in thunder and colored stars. He opened his eyes just at the moment when you would have heard the invisible stick hitting the ground. They were lying under a beech tree in the forest savage. Here we are said Merlin. Get up and dust your clothes. And there, I think continued the magician in a tone of great satisfaction. Because his spells had worked for once without a hitch, is your friend King Pelliner, pricking towards us or the plain. Hallo, hallo cried King Pelliner, popping his visor up and down. It's the young boy with the feather bed, isn't it? A say. What? Yes, it is, said the wart, and I am very glad to see you. Did you manage to catch the beast? No, said King Pelliner. Didn't catch the beast. Oh, do come here, you brash, eh, and leave that bush alone. Cha, cha, naughty, naughty. She runs riot, you know. What? Very keen on rabbits. Eh, tell you there's nothing in it, you beastly dog. Cha. Ta, leave it, leave it, oh, do come to heal, like I tell you, she never does come to heal added King Pelliner. At this the dog put a cock pheasant out of the bush, which rocketed off with a tremendous clatter, and the dog became so excited that it ran round its master three or four times at the end of its rope, panting hoarsely as if it had asthma. King Pelliner's horse stood quite patiently while the rope was being wound round its legs, and Merlin and the wart had to catch the brache, and unwind it before the conversation could proceed. A say said King Pelliner. Thank you very much, A must say. Won't you introduce me to your friend, what? This is my tutor Merlin, a great magician. 
How to do said the king, always like to meet magicians, in fact I always like to meet anybody, you know, it sort of passes the time away, what, on a quest, Hale said Merlin, in his most mysterious manner, Hale replied the king, anxious to make a good impression, they shook hands, did you say Hale, inquired the king, looking about him nervously, I thought it was going to be fine, Nesself. He meant how do you do explained the wart. Ah, uh, yes, how do you do? They shook hands again. Good afternoon said King Pelliner. What do you think the weather looks like now? I think it looks like an anti-cyclone said Merlin. Ah, uh, yes said the king, an anti-cyclone. Well, a suppose a ought to be getting along. At this the king trembled very much, opened and shut his visor several times, coughed, wove his reins into a knot, exclaimed, I beg your pardon, and showed signs of cantering away. He is a white magician, said the wart. You needn't be afraid of him. He is my best friend, your majesty, and in any case he generally gets his spells muddled up. Ah, yes, said King Pelliner. A white magician, what? How small the world is, is it not? How do you do? Hale said Merlin. Hale said King Pelliner. They shook hands for the third time. I shouldn't go away, said Merlin, if I were you. Sir Grummor Grummerson is on the way here to challenge you to a joust. No, you don't say, sir, what you may call it coming here to challenge me to a joust? Assuredly. Good handicap man, I should think it would be a pretty even match. Well, I must say exclaimed the king, it never hails, but it pours. Hail said Merlin, hail said King Pelliner, hail said the ward involuntarily. Now I really won't shake hands with anybody else announced the monarch. We shall simply assume that we have all met before. Is Sir Grummore really coming inquired the wart, hastily changing the subject to challenge King Pelliner to battle? Look yonder said Merlin, and both of them looked in the direction of the outstretched finger. Sir Grummore Grummersome was cantering up the clearing in full panoply of war. Instead of his ordinary helmet with a visor he was wearing the proper tilting helm, which looked like a large coal scuttle, and as he cantered he clanged. He was singing his old school song, We'll tilt together, steady from crupper to pole, and nothing in life shall sever, our love for the dear old coal. Follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, follow up, till the shield ring again and again, with the clanks of the clanky true men. Goodness exclaimed King Pelliner. It's about two months since I had a proper tilt, and last winter they put me up to 18. That was when they had the new handicaps, you know. Sir Grummore had arrived while he was speaking, and had recognized the wart. Mornin said Sir Grummore, you're Sir Ector's boy, ain't you? And who's that chap in the comic hat? That's my tutor, said the wart hurriedly, Merlin, the magician. Sir Grummore looked at Merlin magicians were considered rather middle class by the true jousting set in those days, and said distantly, ah, a magician, how do you do? And this is King Pelliner, said the wart. Sir Grummore Grummerson King Pelliner, how do you do? Said Sir Grummore. Hail said King Pelliner. No, I mean it won't hail, will it? Nice day said Sir Grummore. Yes it is nice, what, isn't it? Then questin' today? Oh, yes, thank you. Always am questing, you know, after the questing beast. Interesting job that, very. Yes, it is interesting. Would you like to see some fumits? By Jove, yes. Like to see some fumits. A have some better ones at home, but these are quite good, really. Bless my soul. So these are her fumits. Yes, these are her fumits. Interesting fumits. Yes, they are interesting, are they? Only you get tired of them, added King Pelliner. Well, well, it's a fine day, isn't it? Yes, it is rather fine. Suppose we'd better have a joust, eh? What? Yes, eh, suppose we had better, said King Pelliner, really. What shall we have it for? 
Oh, the usual thing, I suppose. Would one of you kindly help me on with my helm? They all three had to help him on eventually, for, what with the unscrewing of screws and the easing of nuts and bolts which the king had clumsily set on the wrong thread, when getting up in a hurry that morning, it was quite a feat of engineering to get him out of his helmet and into his helm. The helm was an enormous thing like an oil drum, padded inside with two thicknesses of leather and three inches of straw. As soon as they were ready the two knights stationed themselves at each end of the clearing and then advanced to meet in the middle. Fair knight said King Pelliner, A pray thee tell me thy name. That me regards replied Sir Grumlore, using the proper formula. That is uncourteously said said King Pelliner. What, for no knight nidreadeth for to speak his name openly, but for some reason of shame. Be that as it may, I choose that thou shalt not know my name as at this time, for no asking. Then you must stay and joust with me, false knight. Haven't you got that wrong, Pelliner? inquired Sir Grumlore. I believe it ought to be thou shalt. Oh, I'm sorry Sir Grumlore. Yes, so it should, of course. Then thou shalt stay and joust with me, false knight. Without further words the two gentlemen retreated to the opposite ends of the clearing, futured their spears, and prepared to hurtle together in the preliminary charge. I think we had better climb up this tree said Merlin. You never know what will happen in a joust like this. They climbed up the big beach, which had low, easy branches sticking out in all directions, and the wart stationed himself towards the end of a smooth bow about 15 feet up where he could get a good view. Nothing is so uncomfortable to sit in as a big beach. In order to be able to picture the terrible battle which now took place, there is one thing which ought to be known. A knight in his full armor in those days was generally carrying as much or more than his own weight in metal. He weighed no less than 22 stone, and sometimes as much as 25. This meant that his horse had to be a slow and enormous weight carrier, like the farm horse of today, and that his own movements were so hampered by his burden of iron and padding, that they were toned down into slow motion like the cinema. They're off, cried the wart, holding his breath with excitement. Slowly and majestically, the ponderous horses lumbered into a walk. The spears, which had been pointing in the air, bowed down to a horizontal line and pointed at each other. King Pelliner and Sir Grumlore could be seen to be thumping their horses' sides with their heels for all they were worth. And in a few minutes, the splendid animals had shambled into an earth-shaking imitation of a trot. Clank, rumble, thumpity thump, and now the two knights were flapping their elbows and legs in unison, showing a good deal of daylight at their seats. There was a change in tempo, and Sir Grumore's horse could be definitely seen to be cantering. In another minute King Pelliner's was doing so too. It was a terrible spectacle. Oh, dear, exclaimed the wart, feeling slightly ashamed that his own bloodthirstiness had been responsible for making those two knights joust before him. Do you think they will kill each other? Dangerous sport, said Merlin, shaking his head. Now, cried the wart. With a blood-curdling thumping of iron hoofs the mighty equestrians came together. Their spears wavered for a moment within a few inches of each other's helms, each had chosen the difficult point stroke, and then they were galloping off in opposite directions. Sir Grumore drove his spear deep into the beech tree where they were sitting and stopped dead. King Pelliner, who had been run away with, vanished altogether behind his back. Is it safe to look? inquired the wart, who had shut his eyes tight at the critical moment. Quite safe, said Merlin, it will take them some time to get back. Whoa, whoa, a say, cried King Pelliner in muffled and distant tones, far away among some gorse bushes. Hi, Pelliner, hi, shouted Sir Grumlore. Come back, my dear fella, I'm over here. There was a long pause while the complicated stations of the two knights readjusted themselves, and then King Pelliner was at the opposite end from that at which he had started while Sir Grumlore faced him from his original position. 
traitor knight, cried Sir Grummore, yield, recreant, what, cried King Pelliner. They futured their spears again and thundered into the charge. Oh, said the wart, I hope they don't hurt themselves. But the two mounts were patiently blundering together, and the two knights had simultaneously decided upon the sweeping stroke. Each held his spear straight out at right angles towards the left, and before the wart could say anything further, there was a terrific yet melodious thump. Clang! said the armor like a motor omnibus in collision with a smithy, and the jousters were sitting side by side on the green sward, while their horses cantered off in opposite directions. A splendid fall said Merlin. The two horses pulled themselves up, their duty done, and began resignedly to eat the sword. King Pelliner and Sir Grummore sat looking straight before them, each with the other's spear clasped hopefully under his arm. Well, said the wart, what a bump, they both seem to be all right, so far. Sir Grummore and King Pelliner laboriously got up. Defend thee cried King Pelliner. God save thee cried Sir Grummore. With this they drew their swords and rushed together with such ferocity that each, after dealing the other a dint on the helm, sat down suddenly backwards. Bah! cried King Pelliner. Boo! cried Sir Grummore, also sitting down. Mercy exclaimed the wart. What a combat! The knights had now lost their tempers, and the battle was joined in earnest. It did not matter much, however, for they were so encased in metal, that they could do each other little damage. It took them so long to get up, and the dealing of a blow when you weighed the eighth part of a ton was such a cumbrous business, that every stage of the contest could be marked and pondered. In the first stage King Pelliner and Sir Grummore stood opposite each other for about half an hour, and walloped each other on the helm. There was only opportunity for one blow at a time, and so they more or less took it in turns King Pelliner striking while Sir Grummore was recovering, and vice versa. At first, if either of them dropped his sword or got it stuck in the ground, the other put in two or three extra blows while he was patiently fumbling for it or trying to tug it out. Later, they fell into the rhythm of the thing more perfectly, like the toy mechanical people who saw wood on Christmas trees. Eventually the exercise and the monotony restored their good humor, and they began to get bored. The second stage was introduced as a change by common consent. Sir Grummore stumped off to one end of the clearing while King Pelliner plodded off to the other. Then they turned round and swayed backwards and forwards once or twice in order to get their weight on their toes. When they leant forward they had to run forward in order to keep up with their weight and if they leant too far backwards they fell down. So even walking was a bit complicated. When they had got their weight properly distributed in front of them, so that they were just off their balance, each broke into a trot to keep up with himself. They hurtled together as it had been two boars. They met in the middle breast to breast with a noise of shipwreck and great bells tolling, and both bouncing off fell breathless on their backs. They lay thus for a few minutes panting, then they slowly began to heave themselves to their feet, and it was obvious that they had lost their tempers once again. King Pelliner had not only lost his temper, but seemed to have been a bit astonished by the impact. He got up facing the wrong way, and could not find Sir Grummore. There was some excuse for this, since he had only a tiny slit to peep through, and that was three inches away from his eye owing to the padding of straw. But he looked a bit muddled as well. Perhaps he had broken his spectacles. Sir Grummore was quick to seize his advantage. Take that, cried Sir Grummore, giving the unfortunate monarch a two-handed swipe on the knob as he was slowly turning his head from side to side, peering in the opposite direction. King Pelliner turned round morosely, but his opponent had been too quick for him. He had ambled round so that he was still behind the king, and now gave him another terrific blow in the same place. Where are you? asked King Pelliner. Here cried Sir Grummore, giving him another. The poor king turned himself round as nimbly as possible, 
But Sir Grumor had given him the slip again. Tally ho, back, shouted Sir Grumor with another wallop. Hey, think you're a cad, said the king. Wallop, replied Sir Grumor, doing it. What with the preliminary crash, the repeated blows on the back of the head and the puzzling invisible nature of his opponent King Pelliner, could now be seen to be visibly troubled in his brains. He swayed backwards and forwards under the hail of blows which were administered, and feebly wagged his arms. Poor King said the wart, I wish he wouldn't hit him so. As if in answer to his wish, Sir Grumor paused in his labors. Do you want packs? asked Sir Grumor. King Pelliner made no answer. Sir Grumor favored him with another whack and said, If you don't say packs, I shall cut your head off. I won't, said the king. Wang went the sword on the top of his head. Wang it went again. Wang for the third time. Pax said King Pelliner, mumbling rather. Then, just as Sir Grumor was relaxing with the fruits of victory, he swung round upon him, shouted non, at the top of his voice, and gave him a good push in the middle of the chest. Sir Grumor fell over backwards. Well, exclaimed the wart, what a cheat. I wouldn't have thought it of him. King Pelliner hurriedly sat down on his victim's chest, thus increasing the weight upon him to a quarter of a ton and making it quite impossible for him to move, and began to undo Sir Grumor's helm. You said Pax. A said Pax non under my breath. It's a swizzle. It isn't. So sucks to you. You cad. No, ain't not. Yes, you are. No, ain't not. Yes, you are. A said Pax non. You said Pax. No, A didn't. Yes, you did. No, A didn't. Yes, you did. By this time Sir Grumor's helm was unlaced, and they could see his bare head glaring at King Pelliner, quite purple in the face. Yield thee, recreant, said the king. Shant, said Sir Grumor. You've got to yield, or A shall cut off your head. Cut it off them. Oh, come on, said the king. You know you have to yield when your helm is off. Fain I said Sir Grumor. Well, A shall just cut your head off. I don't care. The king waved his sword menacingly in the air. Go on, said Sir Grumor. I dare you too. The king lowered his sword and said, Oh, A say, do yield, please. You yield, said Sir Grumor. But I can't yield, you know. A am on top of you after all, I'm not A. What? Well, I feigned yielden. Oh, come on, Grumor. A do think you are a cad not to yield. You know very well A can't cut your head off. I wouldn't yield to a cheat who started fightin' after he'd said Pax. Aim not a cheat. You are a cheat. No, aim not. Yes, you are. No, aim not. Yes, you are. Very well said King Pelliner. You can bally well get up and put on your helm, and we'll have a fight. A won't be called a cheat for anybody. Cheat said Sir Grumor. They stood up and fumbled together with the helm, hissing, no, A not and yes, you are until it was safely on. Then they retreated to opposite ends of the clearing, got their weight upon their toes, and came rumbling and thundering together like two runaway trams. Unfortunately they were now so cross that they had both ceased to be vigilant, and in the fury of the moment they missed each other altogether. The momentum of their armor was too great for them to stop till they had passed each other handsomely, and then they maneuvered about in such a manner that neither happened to come within the other's range of vision. It was a bit funny watching them, because King Pelliner, having already been caught from behind once, was continually spinning round to look behind him, and Sir Grumor, having used the stratagem himself, was doing the same thing. Thus they wandered for some five minutes, standing still, listening, clanking, crouching, creeping, peering, walking on tiptoe, and occasionally making a chance swipe behind their backs. Once they were standing within a few feet of each other, back to back, only to stalk off in opposite directions with infinite precaution, and once King Pelliner did hit Sir Grumor with one of his backstrokes, 
but they both immediately spun round so often that they became giddy and mislaid each other afresh. After five minutes, Sir Grumor said, All right, Helena, it's no use hiding, I can see where you are. Ain not hiding, exclaimed King Helena indignantly. Where am I? They discovered each other and went up close together face to face. Cad said Sir Grumor. Ya yeah, said King Pelliner. They turned round and marched off to their corners, seething with indignation. Swindler shouted Sir Grumor. Beastly bully shouted King Pelliner. With this they summoned all their energies together for one decisive encounter, leant forward, lowering their heads like two billy goats, and positively sprinted together for the final blow. Alas, their aim was poor. They missed each other by about five yards past at full steam doing at least eight knots, like ships that pass in the night, but speak not to each other in passing, and hurtled onwards to their doom. Both knights began waving their arms like windmills, anti-clockwise, in the vain effort to slow up. Both continued with undiminished speed. Then Sir Grumor rammed his head against the beach in which the wart was sitting, and King Pelliner collided with a chestnut at the other side of the clearing. The trees shook the forest rang, blackbirds and squirrels cursed, and wood pigeons flew out of their leafy perches half a mile away. The two knights stood to attention while you could count three. Then, with a last unanimous melodious clang, they both fell prostrate on the fatal sword. Stun said Merlin, I should think. Oh, dear, said the wart. Oughtn't we to get down and help them? We could pour water on their heads, said Merlin reflectively, if there were any water. But I don't suppose they'd thank you for making their armor rusty. They'll be all right. Besides, it's time that we were home. But they might be dead. They're not dead. I know, in a minute or two they'll come round and go off home to dinner. Poor King Pelliner hasn't got a home. Then Sir Grumor will invite him to stay the night. They'll be the best of friends when they come too. They always are. Do you think so? My dear boy, I know so. Shut your eyes and we'll be off. The wart gave in to Merlin's superior knowledge. Do you think he asked with his eyes shut that Sir Grumor has a feather bed? Probably. Good said the wart. That will be nice for King Pelliner, even if he was stunned. The Latin words were spoken and the secret passes made. The funnel of whistling noise and space received them. In two twos they were laying under the grandstand, and the sergeant's voice was calling from the opposite side of the tilting ground. Nah then, Master Art, nah then, you've been a-snoozing there long enough. Come out into the sunlight ear with Master K, one two, one two, and see some real tilting. Chapter 8. It was a cold wet evening, such as may happen even towards the end of August, and the wart did not know how to bear himself indoors. He spent some time in the kennels talking to Goat and Cavill, then wandered off to help them turn the spit in the kitchen. But there it was too hot. He was not forced to stay indoors because of the rain, by his female supervisors, as happens all too frequently to the decadent children of the present generation, but the near wetness and dreariness in the open discouraged him from going out. He hated everybody. Confound the boy said Sir Ector. For goodness's sake stop moping by the window there and go and find your tutor. When I was a boy we always used to study on wet days. Yes, and educate our minds. Ward stupid said Kay. Ah, run along, my duck said their old nurse. I can't got time to attend to thy mopsies now. What with all this sorbent washing? Now then, my young master said Hob, let thee run off to thy quarters and stop confusing they fowls. Nah, nah cried the sergeant, you op orf art of ear. I got enough to do polishing of this burr lady harmer. Even the dog boy barked at him when he went back to the kennels. Wart draggled off to the tower room, where Merlin was busy knitting himself a woolen nightcap for the winter. 
I cast off two together at every other line said Merlin, but for some reason it seems to end too sharply. Like an onion, you know, it's the turning of the heel that does you every time. I think I ought to have some more education said the wart. I can't think of anything to do. You think that education is something that ought to be done when all else fails? Inquired Merlin nastily, for he was in a bad mood too. Well said the wart, some sorts of education. Mine? Asked the magician with flashing eyes. Oh, Merlin exclaimed the wart without answering, please give me something to do, because I feel so miserable. Nobody wants me for anything today, and I just don't know how to be sensible. It rains so. You should learn to knit. Couldn't I go out and be something, a fish or anything like that? You've been a fish said Merlin. Nobody with any go needs to do their education twice. Well, could I be a bird? If you knew anything at all said Merlin, which you don't, you would know that a bird doesn't like to fly in the rain because it wets its feathers and makes them stick together. They get bedraggled. I could be a hawk in Hobbes Muse, said the wart stoutly. Then I should be indoors and shouldn't get wet. That's pretty ambitious, said Merlin, to want to be a hawk. You know you will turn me into a hawk when you want to, shouted the wart. But you like to plague me because it's wet. I won't have it. Hoity-toity, said Merlin. Please, said the wart, dear Merlin, turn me into a hawk. If you don't do that I shall do something, I don't know what. Merlin put down his knitting and looked at his pupil over the top of his spectacles. My boy, he said, you shall be everything in the world, animal, vegetable or mineral for all I care, before I've done with you. But you really will have to trust to my superior foresight? Or is it backsight? The time is not ripe for you to be a hawk for one thing, Hob is still in the muse feeding them, and you may just as well sit down for the moment and learn to be a human being. Very well said the wart, if that's a go. And he sat down. After several minutes he said, is one allowed to speak as a human being? Or does the thing about being seen and not heard have to apply? Everybody can speak. That's good. Because I wanted to mention that you have been knitting your beard into that nightcap for three rows now. Well, I'll be fiddled. I should think the best thing would be to cut off the end of your beard. Shall I fetch some scissors? Why didn't you tell me before? I wanted to see what would happen. You run a grave risk, my boy said Merlin coldly, of being turned into a piece of bread and toasted. With this he slowly began to unpick his beard, muttering to himself meanwhile, and taking the greatest precautions not to drop a stitch. Will it be as difficult to fly asked the wart when he thought his tutor had calmed down, as it was to swim, you won't need to fly, I don't mean to turn you into a loose hawk, but only to set you in the muse for the night, so that you can talk to the others. That's the way to learn, by listening to the experts. Will they talk? They talk every night, deep into the darkness. They say about how they were taken and what they can remember of their homes, about their lineage and the great deeds of their ancestors, about their training and what they have learned and will learn. It is military talk really, like you might have in the mess of a crack cavalry regiment. Tactics, small arms, maintenance, betting, famous hunts, wine, women and song. Another subject they have continued Merlin is food. It's a depressing thought. But of course they are mainly trained by hunger. They're a hungry lot poor chaps thinking of the best restaurants where they used to go and how they had champagne and caviar and gypsy music. Of course, they all come of noble blood. What a shame that they should be kept prisoners and hungry. Well, they don't really understand that they are prisoners any more than the cavalry officers do. They look on themselves as being dedicated to their profession, like an order of knighthood or something like that. You see, the membership of the muse is after all restricted to the raptors and that does help a lot. They know that none of the lower classes can get in. Their screen perches don't carry blackbirds or such trash as that. And then, as to the hungry part, 
They are far from starving or that kind of hunger. They are in training, you know, and like everybody in strict training, they think about food. How soon can I begin? You can begin now, if you want to, for my insight tells me that Hop has this minute finished for the night. But first of all you must choose what kind of hawk you would prefer to be. I should like to be a merlin, said the wart politely. This answer pleased the magician. A very good choice, he said, and if you please, we will proceed at once. The wart got up from his stool and stood in front of his tutor. Merlin put down his knitting. First you go small, said Merlin, pressing him on the top of the head until he was a bit smaller than a pigeon. Then you stand on the ball of your toes, bend at the knees, hold your elbows to your sides, lift your hands to the level of your shoulders, and press your first and second fingers together, as also your third and fourth. Look, it is like this. With these words the aged magician stood upon tiptoe and did as he had explained. The wart copied in carefully and wondered what would happen next. What did happen was that Merlin, who had been saying the final spells under his breath, suddenly turned himself into a condor, leaving the wart standing on tiptoe unchanged. He stood there as if he were drying himself in the sun, with a wing spread of about 11 feet a bright orange head and a magenta carbuncle. He looked very surprised and rather funny. Come back, said the wart. You've changed the wrong one. It's this by Our Lady Spring Cleaning, exclaimed Merlin, turning back into himself. Once you let a woman into your study for half an hour, you don't know where to lay your hands on the right spell. Not if it was ever so. Stand up and we'll try again. This time the now tiny wart felt his toes shooting out and scratching on the floor. He felt his heels rise and stick out behind and his knees draw into his stomach. His thighs got quite short. A web of skin grew from his wrists to his shoulders, while his primary feathers burst out into little soft quills from the end of his fingers and quickly grew. His secondary sprouted out along his forearms, and a charming little false primary sprang from the end of each thumb. The dozen feathers of his tail, with the double-deck feathers in the middle, grew out in the twinkling of an eye, and all the covert feathers of his back and breast and shoulders slipped out of the skin to hide the roots of the more important plumes. Wart looked quickly at Merlin ducked his head between his legs and had a look through there, rattled his feathers into place, and began to scratch his chin with the sharp talon of one toe. Good said Merlin. Now hop up on my hand, ah. Be careful and don't gripe and listen to what I have to tell you. I shall take you into the muse now that Hop has locked up for the night, and I shall put you loose and unhooded beside Balin and Balin. Now pay attention. Don't go close to anybody without speaking first. You must remember that most of them are hooded and might be startled into doing something rash. You can trust Balin and Balin, also the Kestrel and the Spar Hawk. Don't go within reach of the falcon unless she invites you to. On no account must you stand beside Cully's special enclosure, for he is unhooded and will go for you through the mesh if he gets half a chance. He is not quite right in his brains, poor chap, and if he once grips you, you will never leave that grip again. Remember that you are visiting a kind of Spartan military mess. These fellows are regulars. As the junior subaltern your only business is to keep your mouth shut, speak when you're spoken to and not interrupt. I bet I'm more than a subaltern said the ward if I am a Merlin. Well, as a matter of fact you are. You will find that both the Kestrel and the Spar Hawk are polite to you, but for all sake's sake, don't interrupt the senior Merlins or the Falcon. She's the honorary colonel of the regiment you know. And as for Cully, well, he's a colonel too, even if he is infantry, so you must mind your P's and Q's. I will be careful, said the wart, who was beginning to feel rather scared. Good, I shall come for you in the morning before Hob is up. All the hawks were silent as Merlin carried their new companion into the mews, and silent for some time afterwards, when they had been left in the dark. 
The rain had given place to a full August moonlight, so clear that you could see a woolly bear caterpillar 15 yards away out of doors as it climbed up and up the knobbly sandstone of the great keep, and it took the ward only a few moments for his eyes to become accustomed to the diffused brightness inside the muse. The darkness became watered with light, with silver radiance, and then it was an eerie sight which dawned upon his vision. Each hawker falcon stood in the silver upon one leg, the other tucked up inside the apron of its panel, and each was a motionless statue of a knight in armor. They stood gravely in their plumed helmets, spurred and armed. The canvas or sacking screens of their perches moved heavily in a breath of wind, like banners in a chapel, and the rapt nobility of the air kept their knights vigil in nightly patience. In those days they used to hood everything they could, even the Goshik and the Merlin, which are no longer hooded according to the modern practice. Wart drew his breath at the sight of all these stately figures standing so still that they might have been cut of stone. He was overwhelmed by their magnificence and felt no need of Merlin's warning that he was to be humble and behave himself. Presently there was a gentle ringing of a bell. The great peregrine falcon had bestirred herself and now said, in a high nasal voice which came from her aristocratic nose, Gentlemen, you may converse. There was dead silence. Only, in the far corner of the room, which had been netted off for Kali loose there, unhooded and deep in mold, they could hear a faint muttering from the Chileric infantry colonel. Damned administration he was mumbling, damned politicians. Is this a damned dagger that I see before me, the handle towards my hand, damned spot? Now Cully hast thou but one brief hour to live, and then thou must be damned perpetually. Colonel said the peregrine coldly, not before the young officers. I beg your pardon, ma'am, said the poor colonel at once. It's something that gets into my head, you know, some deep damnation. There was silence again, formal, terrible and calm. Who is the new officer? inquired the first fierce and beautiful voice. Nobody answered. Speak for yourself, sir, commanded the peregrine, looking straight before her as if she were talking in her sleep. They could not see him through their hoods. Please began the ward, I am a Merlin. And he stopped, scared in the stillness. Balin, who was one of the real Merlins standing beside him, leant over and whispered quite kindly in his ear, don't be afraid, call her madam. I am a Merlin, madam, and it please you. Uh, Merlin, that is good. And what branch of the Merlins do you stoop from? The ward did not know in the least what branch he stooped from, but he dared not be found out now in his lie. Madam said the ward, I am one of the Merlins of the Forest Savage. There was silence at this again, the silver silence which he had begun to dread. There are the Yorkshire Merlins, said the honorary colonel in her slow voice at last, and the Welsh Merlins, and the McMerlins of the North. Then there are the Salisbury ones and several from the neighborhood of Exmoor. I don't think I have ever heard of any family in the forest savage. It would be a cadet branch, madam said Balin, I dare say. Bless him thought the wart. I shall catch him a special sparrow tomorrow and give it to him behind Hobbs' back. That will be the solution, Captain Balin, no doubt. The silence fell again. At last the peregrine rang her bell. She said, we will proceed with the catechism prior to swearing him in. The wart heard the spar hop to his left, giving several nervous coughs at this, but the peregrine paid no attention. Merlin of the forest savage said the peregrine. What is a beast of the foot? A beast of the foot replied the wart, blessing his stars that Sir Ector had chosen to give him a first-rate education, is a horse, or a hound, or a hawk. Why are these called beasts of the foot? Because these beasts depend upon the powers of their feet, so that, by law, any damage to the feet of hawk, hound, or horse, is reckoned as damage to its life. A lamed horse is a murdered horse. Good said the peregrine. What are your most important members? My wings said the ward after a moment, guessing because he did not know. 
At this there was a simultaneous tintinabulation of all the bells, as each graven image lowered its raised foot in distress, they stood up on both feet now, disturbed. You're what? cried the peregrine sharply. He said his damned wings said Colonel Cully from his private enclosure, and damn be he who first cries hold enough, but even a thrush has wings, cried the humble kestrel, speaking for the first time in his sharp-beaked alarm, think, whispered Balin, under his breath, the wart thought feverishly, a thrush had wings, tail, eyes, legs apparently everything, my talons, it will do said the peregrine kindly, after one of her dreadful pauses, the answer ought to be feet just as it is to all the other questions, but talons will do, all the hawks, and of course we are using the term loosely for some were hawks and some were falcons, raised their belled feet again and sat at ease, what is the first law of the foot? Think said friendly little Balin, behind his false primary, the wart thought, and thought right, never let go he said, last question said the peregrine, how would you, as a merlin, kill a pigeon bigger than yourself, wart was lucky in this one, for he had heard Hob giving a description of how Balin did it one afternoon, and he answered warily, I should strangle her with my foot, good, said the peregrine, Bravo, cried all the others, raising their feathers. 90% said the sparhawk after a quick sum. That is, if you give him a half for the talons. The devil damn me black. Colonel, please. Little Balin whispered to the wart, Colonel Cully is not quite right in his wits. It is his liver, we believe, but the kestrel says it is the constant strain of living up to her ladyship's standard. He says that her ladyship spoke to him from her full rank once, cavalry to infantry, you know, and that he just closed his eyes and got the vertigo. He has never been the same since. Captain Balin said the peregrine, it is rude to whisper, we will proceed to swear the new officer in, now, Padre, if you please, the poor spar hawk, who had been getting more and more nervous for some time, blushed deeply and began faltering out a complicated oath about varvels, jesses and hoods, with this varble the wart heard, I the endow love, honor and obey till jess us do part, but before the padre had got to the end of it, he broke down altogether and sobbed out, Oh, please your ladyship, I beg your pardon, but I've forgotten to keep any tirings. Tirings are bones and things, explained Balin, and of course you have to swear on bones. Forgotten to keep any tirings, but it is your duty to keep tirings. I, I know. What have you done with them? The sparhawk's voice broke at the enormity of his confession. I, I ate him wept the unfortunate priest. Nobody said anything. The dereliction of duty was too terrible for mere words. All stood on two feet and turned their blind heads towards the culprit. Not a word of reproach was spoken. Only during an utter silence of five minutes, they could hear the incontinent priest sniveling and hiccoughing to himself. Well said the peregrine at last the initiation. Will be put off till tomorrow. If you will excuse me, madam said Balin, perhaps we could manage the ordeal part of it tonight? I believe the candidate is loose, for I did not hear him being tied up. At the mention of ordeal the war trembled within himself, and privately determined that Balin should have not one feather of Balin's sparrow next day. Thank you Captain Balin, I was reflecting upon that subject myself. Balin shut up. Are you loose, candidate? Oh, madam, yes, I am, if you please. But I don't think I want an ordeal. The ordeal is customary. Let me see continued the honorary colonel reflectively. What was the last ordeal we had? Can you remember, Captain Balin? My ordeal, man said the friendly Merlin, was to hang by my jesses during the third watch. If he's loose he can't do that. You could strike him yourself, man said the kestrel, judiciously, you know, send him over to stand by Colonel Cully while we ring thrice, said the other Merlin, oh, no, cried the crazy colonel in an agony out of his remoter darkness, oh, no, your ladyship, I beg of you not to do that, 
I am such a damn villain, your ladyship, that I don't answer for the consequences. Spare the poor boy, your ladyship, and lead us not into temptation. Colonel, control yourself. That ordeal will do very well. Oh, madam, I was warned not to stand by Colonel Cully. Warned? And by whom? The poor wart realized now that he must choose between confessing himself a human and learning no more of their secrets, or going through with his ordeal, in order to earn his education. He did not want to be a coward. I will stand by the colonel, madam, he said, immediately noticing that his voice sounded insulting. The peregrine falcon paid no attention to the tone. It is well, she said. But first we must have the hymn. Now, Padre, if you haven't eaten your hymns as well as your tirings, will you be so kind as to lead us in ancient, but not modern number 23, the ordeal hymn. And you, Mr. Kishi added to the kestrel, you had better keep quiet, for you are always too high. The hawk stood still in the moonlight while the spar hawk counted one, two, three, then all those curved or toothed beaks opened in their hoods to a brazen unison, and this is what they fiercely chanted. Life is blood, shed and offered, the eagles I can face this dree. To beasts of chase the lie is proffered, team or mortis contribit me. The beast of foot sings hold fist only, for flesh is bruckle and foot is slee. Strength to the strong and the lordly and lonely, team or mortis exult at me. Shame to the slothful and woe to the weak one, death to the dreadful who turn to flee. Blood to the tearing, the talonid, the beaked one, team or mortis is me. Very nice said the peregrine, Captain Bowen. I think you were a little off on the top sea. And now, candidate, you will go over and stand next to Colonel Cully's enclosure, while we ring our bells thrice. On the third ring you may move as quickly as you like. Very good, madam, said the wart, quite fearless with resentment. He flipped his wings and was sitting on the extreme end of the screen perch, next to Cully's enclosure of string netting. Boy, boy, cried the colonel in an unearthly voice, don't come near me, don't come near. Ah, tempt not the foul fiend to his damnation. I don't fear you, sir, said the wart. Don't vex yourself, for no harm will come to either of us. No harm, quotha. Ah, go, before it is too late. I feel eternal longings in me. Never fear, sir. They have only to ring three times. At this all the knights lowered their raised legs and gave them a solemn shake. The first sweet persuasive tinkling filled the room. Madam, madam, cried the colonel in torture. Have pity, have pity on a damned man of blood. Ring out the old, ring in the new. I can't hold off much longer. Be brave, sir, said the wart softly. Be brave, sir. Why, but two nights since, one met the duke about midnight in a lane behind St. Mark's Church, with the leg of a man upon his shoulder, and he howled fearfully. It's nothing, said the wart. Nothing, said he was a wolf, only the difference was a wolf's skin was hairy on the outside, his on the inside. Rip up my flesh and try, ah, for quietus, with a bare bodkin. The bells rang for the second time. The wart's heart was thumping heavily and pleading for the third release, but now the colonel was sidling towards him along the perch. Stamp, stamp, he went, striking the woody trot on with a convulsive grip at every pace. His poor, mad, brooding eyes glared in the moonlight, shone against the persecuted darkness of his scowling brow. There was nothing cruel about him, no ignoble passion. He was terrified of the wart, not triumphing, and he must slay. If it were done when tis done, whispered the colonel, then twere well it were done quickly. Who would have thought the young man had so much blood in him? Colonel, said the wart, but held himself there. Boy, cried the colonel, speak, stop me, mercy. There is a cat behind you, said the wart calmly, or a pine marten. Look, the colonel turned swift as a wasp sting and menaced into the gloom. There was nothing. He swung his wild eyes again upon the wart. 
guessing at the trick. Then, in the cold voice of an adder, the bell invites me he hissed for the last time. Hear it not, Merlin, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. The third bells were indeed ringing as he spoke, and honor was allowed to move. The ordeal was over, and the wart might fly. But as he moved, but as he flew quicker than any movement or flight in the world, the terrible sickles had shot out from the colonel's plated legs not flashed out, for they moved too quick for sight, and with a thump, with a clutch, with an apprehension. Like being arrested by a big policeman, the great scimitars had fixed themselves in his retreating thumb. They fixed themselves, and fixed irrevocably. Gripe, gripe, the enormous thigh muscles tautened into convulsions. Then the wart was four yards further down the screen, and Colonel Cully was standing on one foot, with a few meshes of string netting, and the wart's false primary, with its covert feathers, vice-fisted in the other. Two or three minor feathers drifted softly in a moonbeam towards the floor. Well stood, cried Balin, delighted. A very gentlemanly exhibition, said the peregrine, not minding that Captain Balin had spoken before her. Amen, amen, said the spar hawk. Brave heart, cried the kestrel. Might we give him the triumph song? asked Balin, now relenting. Certainly, said the peregrine. And they all sang together, led by Colonel Cully at the top of his voice, all belling triumphantly in the terrible moonlight. The mountain birds are sweeter, but the valley birds are fatter, and so we deemed it neater to carry off the ladder. We met a cowering coney and struck him through the vitals. The coney was like honey and squealed our requitals. Some struck the lark in feathers, whose puffing clouds were shed off, some plucked the partridge's nethers, while others pulled his head off, but Ward the king of Merlin's, struck foot most far before us, his birds and beasts, supply our feasts, and his feasts are roarious chorus. Mark my words, cried the beautiful Balin, forgetful of all etiquette. We shall have a regular king in that young candidate. Now then, boys, chorus all together for the last time. But Ward the king of Merlin's, struck foot most far before us. His birds and beasts, supply our feasts. And his damn fine show cried Colonel Cully, with most lamentable infantry manners, at the top of his crazy voice, quite out of tune, or roarious chorus. Chapter 9 Well, said the wart, as he woke up in his own bed next morning. What a horrible, grand crew! Kay sat up in bed and began scolding like a squirrel. Where were you all last night? He cried. I believe you climbed out. I shall tell my father and get you tanned. You know we aren't allowed out after curfew. What have you been doing? I looked for you everywhere. I know you climbed out. The boys had a way of sliding down a rainwater pipe into the moat, which they could swim on secret occasions, when it was necessary to be out at night to wait for a badger for instance, or to catch tench, which can only be taken just before dawn. Oh, shut up said the wart, I'm sleepy, Kay said, wake up, wake up, you beast, where have you been, I shan't tell you. He was sure that Kay would not believe the story, but only call him a liar, and get angrier than ever. If you don't tell me I shall kill you, you won't, then, I will. The wart turned over on his other side. Beast said Kay, he took a fold of the wart's arm between the nails of first finger and thumb, and pinched for all he was worth. Wart kicked like a salmon which had been suddenly hooked, and hit Kay wildly in the eye. In a trice they were out of bed pale and indignant, and looking rather like skinned rabbits for in those days, nobody wore clothes in bed, and whirling their arms like windmills, in the effort to do each other mischief. Kay was older and bigger than the wart, so that he was bound to win in the end, but he was more nervous and imaginative. He could imagine the effect of each blow that was aimed at him, and this weakened his defense. Wart was only an infuriated hurricane. 
Leave me alone shouted the ward again and again. Leave me alone, can't you? And all the while he did not leave Kay alone, but with head down and swinging arms made it impossible for Kay to do as he was bid. They punched entirely at each other's faces, as boys will. Kay had a longer reach and a heavier fist. He straightened his arm out more in self-defense than in anything else. And the wart smacked his own eye upon the end of it. The sky became a noisy and shocking black, streaked outwards with a blaze of meteors. The wart began to sob and pant. He managed to get in a blow upon his opponent's nose, and this began to bleed. Kate lowered his defense, turned his back upon the wart, and said in a cold, snuffing, reproachful voice, Now it's bleeding. The battle was over. K lay upon his back on the stone floor, bubbling blood out of his nose, and the wart, with a black eye, fetched the enormous key out of the door to put down K's back. Neither of them spoke. Presently K turned over on his face and began to sob. He said, Merlin does everything for you, but he never does anything for me. At this the wart felt he had been a beast. He dressed himself in silence and hurried off to find Merlin. On the way he was caught by his nurse. Ah, you little helot exclaimed she, shaking him by the arm. You've been a battling again with that there Master K. Look at your poor eye, I do declare. It's enough to baffle the College of Sturgeons. It's all right said the wart. No, that it isn't my pop it cried his nurse, getting crosser and showing signs of slapping him. Come now, how did you do it before I have you whipped? I knocked it on the bed pissed, said the wart sullenly. The old nurse immediately folded him to her broad bosom, patted him on the back, and said, There, there, my docible. It's the same story Sir Ector told me when I caught him with a blue eye gone forty year. Nothing like a good family for sticking to a good lie. There, my innocent, you come along of me to the kitchen, and we'll slap a nice bit of steak across him in no time. But you hadn't ought to fight with people bigger than yourself. It's all right, said the ward again, disgusted by this fuss, but fate was bent on punishing him, and the old lady was inexorable. It took him half an hour to escape, and then only at the price of carrying with him a juicy piece of raw beef which he was supposed to hold over his eye. Nothing like a maily rump for drawing out the humors his nurse had said, and the cook had answered us hand, seen a sweeter bit of raw since Easter. No, nor a bloodier. I will keep the foul thing for Balin thought the wart, resuming his search for his tutor. He had found him without trouble in the tower room which he had chosen when he arrived. All philosophers prefer to live in towers, as may be seen by visiting the room which Erasmus chose in his college at Cambridge, but Merlin's tower was even more beautiful than his. It was the highest room in the castle, directly below the lookout of the great tower, and from its window, you could gaze across the open field, with its rights of war and across the park, and the chase, until your eye finally wandered out over the distant blue tree tops of the forest savage. This sea of leafy timber rolled away and away in knobs like the surface of porridge, until it was finally lost in remote mountains which nobody had ever visited, and the the cloud-capped towers and gorgeous palaces of heaven. Merlin's comments upon the black eye were of a philosophic nature. The discoloration, he said, is caused by hemorrhage into the tissues, echimosis, and passes from dark purple through green to yellow before it disappears. There seemed to be no sensible reply to this. I suppose you had it continued Merlin, fighting with Kay? Yes. How did you know? Ah. Uh, well, there it is. I came to ask you about Kay. Speak, demand, I'll answer. Well, Kay thinks it unfair that you are always turning me into things and not him. I haven't told him about it, but I think he guesses. I think it's unfair too. It is unfair. So will you turn us both next time that we are turned? Merlin had finished his breakfast and was puffing at the Meerschaum pipe, which made his pupil believe that he breathed fire. Now he took a very deep puff, looked at the wart, opened his mouth to speak, changed his mind, blew out the smoke, and drew in another lungful. 
Sometimes he said, life does seem to be unfair. Do you know the story of Elijah and the Rabbi Jachanin? No said the wart. He sat down resignedly upon the most comfortable part of the floor, perceiving that he was in for something like the parable of the looking glass. This rabbi said Merlin went on a journey with the prophet Elijah. They walked all day and at nightfall they came to a humble cottage of a poor man whose only treasure was a cow. The poor man ran out of his cottage and his wife ran too to welcome the strangers for the night and to offer them all the simple hospitality which they were able to give in straitened circumstances. Elijah and the rabbi were entertained with plenty of cow's milk sustained by homemade bread and butter and they were put to sleep in the best bed while their kindly hosts lay down before the kitchen fire. But in the morning the poor man's cow was dead. Go on. They walked all the next day and came that evening to the house of a very wealthy merchant whose hospitality they craved. The merchant was cold and proud and rich and all that he would do for the prophet and his companion was to lodge them in a coast and feed them on bread and water. In the morning, however, Elijah thanked him very much and sent for a mason to repair one of his walls which happened to be falling down as a return for his kindness. The rabbi Jachanin, unable to keep silence any longer, begged the holy man to explain the meaning of his dealings with human beings. In regard to the poor man who received us so hospitably replied the prophet, it was decreed that his wife was to die that night. But in reward for his kindness, God took the cow instead of the wife. I repaired the wall of the rich miser, because a chest of gold was concealed near the place, and if the miser had repaired the wall himself, he would have discovered the treasure. Say not therefore to the Lord, What doest thou, but say in thy heart, Must not the Lord of all the earth do right? It's a nice sort of story, said the wart, because it seemed to be over. I am sorry, said Merlin, that you should be the only one to get my extra tuition, but then, you see, I was only sent for that. I don't see that it would do any harm for Kay to come to, nor do I, but the rabbi Jachanin didn't see why the miser should have had his wool repaired. I understand that, said the wart doubtfully, but I still think it's a shame that the cow died. Couldn't I have Kay with me just once? Merlin said gently, perhaps what is good for you might be bad for him. Besides, remember he has never asked to be turned into anything. He wants to be turned for all that. I like Kay, you know, and I think people don't understand him. He has to be proud because he is frightened. You still don't follow what I mean. Suppose he had gone as a Merlin last night and failed in the ordeal and lost his nerve. How do you know about that ordeal? Ah, uh, well, there it is again. Very well said the ward obstinately. But suppose he hadn't failed in the ordeal and hadn't lost his nerve. I don't see why you should have to suppose that he would have. Oh, flout the boy, cried Merlin passionately. You don't seem to see anything this morning. What is it that you want me to do? Turn me and Kay into snakes or something. Merlin took off his spectacles, dashed them on the floor, and jumped upon them with both feet. Castor and Pollux blow me to Bermuda, he exclaimed, and immediately vanished with a frightful roar. The wart was still staring at his tutor's chair in some perplexity, a few moments later, when Merlin reappeared. He had lost his hat and his hair and beard were all tangled up, as if by a hurricane. He sat down again, straightening his gown with trembling fingers. Why did you do that? asked the wart. I didn't do it on purpose. Do you mean to say that Castor and Pollux did blow you to Bermuda? Let this be a lesson to you replied Merlin, not to swear. I think we had better change the subject. We were talking about Kay. Yes and what I was going to say before my hem. My visit to the still vexed Bermuds was this. I can't change K into things. The power was not deputed to me when I was sent. Why this was so, neither you nor I am able to say, but such remains the fact. I have tried to hint at some of the reasons for the fact, but you won't take them, so you must just accept the fact in its naked reality. 
Now please stop talking until I have got my breath back and my hat. The wart sat quietly while Merlin closed his eyes and began to mutter to himself. Presently a curious black cylindrical hat appeared on his head. Merlin examined it with a look of disgust, said bitterly, and they call this service, and handed it back to the air. He closed his eyes and produced with growing indignation in rapid succession, this, and this, and this. Finally he stood up in a passion and exclaimed, come here. The ward and Archimedes looked at each other, wondering which was meant Archimedes had been sitting all the while on the windowsill, and looking at the view, for, of course, he never left his master, but Merlin did not pay them any attention. Now said Merlin furiously, apparently to nobody, do you think you are being funny? Very well then, why do you do it? That's no excuse. Naturally I meant the one I was wearing. But wearing now, of course, you fool. I don't want a hat I was wearing in 1800. Have you no sense of time at all? Merlin took off his sailor hat and held it out to the air for inspection. This is an anachronism he said severely. That's what it is, a beastly anachronism. Archimedes seemed to be accustomed to these scenes for he now said in a reasonable voice. Why don't you ask for the hat by name, master? Say, I want my magician's hat not, I want the hat I was wearing. Perhaps the poor chap finds it as difficult to live backwards in time as you do. I want my magician's hat said Merlin sulkily. Instantly the long pointed cap was standing on his head. The tension in the air relaxed, Wart sat down again on the floor, and Archimedes resumed his toilet pulling his pinions and tail feathers through his beak to smooth the barbs together. Each barb had hundreds of little hooks or barbules on it, by means of which the barbs of the feather were held together. He was stroking them into place. Merlin said, I beg your pardon, I am not having a very good day today, and there it is, about K said the wart, even if you can't change him into things, couldn't you give us both an adventure without changing? Merlin made a visible effort to control his temper again, and to consider this question dispassionately, he was sick of the subject altogether. I can't do any magic for Kay, he said slowly, except my own magic that I have anyway, backside and inside and that. Do you mean anything I could do with that? What does your backside do? It tells me what you would say is going to happen, and the insight sometimes says what is or was happening in other places. Is there anything happening just now? Anything that Kay and I could go to see? Merlin immediately struck himself on the brow and exclaimed excitedly, Now I see it all. Yes, of course there is, and you are going to see it. Yes, you must take Kay and hurry up about it. You must go immediately after Mass. Have breakfast first and go immediately after Mass. Yes, that's it. Go straight to Hobbs' strip of barley in the open field, and follow that line until you come to something. That will be splendid, yes, and I shall have a nap this afternoon, instead of that filthy Sumuli logic hills. Or have I had the nap? You haven't had it said Archimedes. That's still in the future yet, master. Splendid, splendid. And mind, Wart, don't forget to take Kay with you, so that I can have my nap. What shall we see? Asked the Wart. Ah, don't plague me about a little thing like that. You run along now. There's a good boy, and mind you don't forget to take Kay with you. Why ever didn't you mention it before? Don't forget to follow beyond the strip of barley. Well, well, well. This is the first half holiday I've had since I started this confounded tutorship. First I think I shall have a little nap before luncheon, and then I think I shall have a little nap before tea. Then I shall have to think of something I can do before dinner. What shall I do before dinner Archimedes? Have a little nap. I expect said the owl coldly turning his back upon his master because he, as well as the wart, enjoyed to see life.
Chapter 10 Wart knew that if he told the elder boy about his conversation with Merlin, Kay would very probably refuse to be condescended to and not come, so he said nothing. It was strange, but their battle had made them friends again, and each could look the other in the eye with a kind of confused affection. They went together unanimously though shyly, without the need for explanations and found themselves standing at the end of Hobbs Barley Strip after Mass, without the wart having to use any ingenuity. When they were there it was easy. Come on, said the wart. Merlin told me to tell you that there was something along here that was specially for you. What sort of thing? asked Kay. An adventure. How do we get to it? We ought to follow along the line which the strip makes, and I suppose that would take us into the forest. We should have to keep the sun just there on our left, but allow for its moving. All right, said Kay. What is the adventure? I don't know. They went along the strip and followed its imaginary line over the park and over the chase, keeping their eyes skinned all the time for some miraculous happening. They wondered whether half a dozen young pheasants they started had anything curious about them, and Kay was ready to swear that one of them was white. If it had been white, and if a black eagle had suddenly swooped down upon it from the sky, they would have known quite well that wonders were afoot, and that all they had to do was to follow the pheasant or the eagle until they reached the maiden in the enchanted castle. However, the pheasant was not white, and no eagle appeared. At the end of the forest case said, I suppose we shall have to go into this? Merlin said to follow the line. Well said Kay, I'm not afraid. If the adventure was specially for me, it's bound to be a jolly good one. They went in and were surprised to find that the going was not bad at all. It was about the same as a big wood might be nowadays, whereas the common forest of those times was much more like a jungle on the Amazon. There were no pheasant shooting proprietors then to see that the undergrowth was thinned and not 1,000th part of the number of the present-day timber merchants who prune away judiciously at the few remaining woods. The most of the forest savage was almost impenetrable, an enormous barrier of eternal trees, the dead ones fallen against the live and held to them by ivy, the living struggling up in competition with each other towards the sun which gave them life, the floor boggy through lack of drainage, or tindery from old wood, so that you might suddenly tumble through a decayed tree trunk into an ant's nest, or laced with brambles and bindweed and honeysuckle and convolvulus and teasels, and the stuff which country people call sweethearts, until you would be torn to pieces in three yards. This part was good. Hobbs' line pointed down what seemed to be a succession of glades, shady and murmuring places, in which the wild thyme was droning with bees. The insect season was past its peak, for it was really the time for wasps on fruit. But there were many fritillaries still, with tortoise shells and red admirals on the flowering mint. Wart pulled a leaf of this and munched it like chewing gum as they walked. It's queer, he said, but there have been people here. Look, there is one hoof mark, and it was shod. You don't see much, said Kay, for there is a man. Sure enough, there was a man at the end of the next glade, sitting with a wood axe by the side of a tree which he had felled. He was a queer-looking, tiny man, with a hunchback and a face like mahogany, and he was dressed in numerous pieces of old leather, which he had secured about his brawny legs and arms with pieces of cord. He was eating a hunch of bread and cheese with a knife, which years of sharpening had worn into a mere streak, leaning his back against one of the highest trees that they had ever seen. The white flakes of wood lay all about him. The dressed stump of the fell tree looked very new. His eyes were bright like a fox's. I expect he will be the adventure whispered Wart. Who said K? You have knights in armor, or dragons or things like that in adventure, not dirty old men cutting wood. Well, I'm going to ask him what happens along here, anyway. They went up to the small munching woodman, 
who did not seem to have seen them, and asked him where the glades were leading to. They asked two or three times before they discovered that the poor fellow was either deaf or mad or both. He neither answered nor moved. Oh, come on, said Kay. He's probably loopy like what? and doesn't know what he is at. Let's go and leave the old fool. They went on for nearly a mile, and still the going was good. There were no paths exactly, and the glades were not continuous. Anybody who came there by chance would have thought that there was just the one glade which he was in. A couple of hundred yards long, unless he went to the end of it, and discovered another one, screened by a few trees. Now and then they found a cut stump with the marks of the axe on it, but mostly these had been carefully covered over with brambles or altogether grubbed up. The wart considered that the glades must have been made. Kay caught the wart by the arm, at the edge of the clearing, and pointed silently towards its further end. There was a grass bank there, swelling up gently towards a gigantic sycamore upwards of 90 feet high, which stood upon its top. On the bank there was an equally gigantic man lying at his ease, with a dog beside him. This man was as notable as the sycamore, for he stood or lay seven feet without his shoes, and he was dressed in nothing but a kind of kilt made of Lincoln green worsted. He had a leather bracer on his left forearm. His enormous brown chest supported the dog's head, it had pricked its ears and was watching the boys, but made no other movement, which the muscles gently lifted as they rose and fell. The man appeared to be fast asleep. There was a seven-foot bow beside him, with some arrows more than a cloth yard long. He, like the woodman, was the color of mahogany, and the curled hairs on his chest made a golden haze where the sun caught them. He's it whispered Kay excitedly. They went up to the man cautiously for fear of the dog, but the dog only followed them with its eyes keeping its chin pressed firmly to the chest of its beloved master and giving them the least suspicion of a wag from its tail. It moved its tail without lifting it two inches in the grass. The man opened his eyes, obviously he had not been asleep at all smiled at the boys, and jerked his thumb in the direction which pointed further up the glade. Then he stopped smiling and shut his eyes. Excuse me said Kay, what happens up there? The man made no answer and kept his eyes closed. But he lifted his hand again and pointed onwards with his thumb. He means us to go on said Kay. It certainly is an adventure said the wart. I wonder if that dumb woodman could have climbed up the big tree he was leaning against and sent a message to this tree that we were coming. He certainly seems to have been expecting us. At this the naked giant opened one eye and looked at Ward in some surprise, then he opened both eyes, laughed all over his big twinkling face, sat up patted the dog picked up his bow, and rose to his feet, very well, then, young meesters he said, still laughing, us will come along with ye after all, young heads still neat the sharpest, they do say, Kay looked at him in blank surprise, who are you, he asked, Naylor said the giant, John Naylor in the wide world it were, till us come to be a man of the Ood. Then twere John Little for some time, in the Ood like, but mostly folks put it backward now, and calls us Little John. Oh, cried the ward in delight, I've heard of you often, when they tell stories in the evening, of you and Robin Hood. Not Hood said Little John reprovingly, that bain't the way to name an Neister, not in the Ood. But it's Robin Hood in the story said Kay, ah, them book learning chaps, they don't know all, home ever tis time us be stepping along. They fell in on either side of the enormous happy man, and had to run one step in three to keep up with him for, although he talked very slowly, he walked on his bare feet very fast. The dog trotted at heel. Please ask the wart, where are you taking us? White to Robin Hood, seemingly. And you sharp enough to guess that also Mr. Art? The giant gave him a sly peep out of the corner of his eye at this, for he knew quite well that he had set the boy's two problems at once first, what was Robin's real name, and second, how did he come to know the warts? 
The wart fixed on the second question first. How did you know my name? Ah said little John, ah snowed. Does Robin Hood know we are coming? Nay, my duck, a young scholar like thee should speak his name scholarly. Well, what is his name? Cried the wart, between exasperation and being out of breath from running to keep up. You said Ood. So it is Ood, my duck. Robin Ood, like the Ood's young running through. And a grand fine name it is. Robin Wood, I, Robin Ood. What else should on be, seeing as he loves em? Fame free pleases the Oods, and fine pleases. Let thee sleep in em come summer come winter, without brick nor thatch, and hunt in em with the good earth in the springtime, and number of em as they brings forward their comely bright leaves, according to order, or loses of em by the same order backwards. Let thee stand in em that thou best not seen, and move in em that thou best not heard, and warm thee with em I, the golden light of their timbers, as thou fell'st on sleep a fame proper fine places the oods for a free man of hands and heart, Kay said, but I thought all Robin Wood's men wore hose and jerkins of Lincoln Green, that us do replied little John, in the winter like, when us needs em, or with leather leggings at Ood Ork, but here by summer tis more seasonable thus for the pickets, who have not to do save watch. Were you a sentry then? Aye, and so were wolved much, as you spoke to by the fell tree, and I think exclaimed Kay triumphantly, that this next big tree which we are coming to, will be the stronghold of Robin Wood. They were indeed approaching the monarch of the forest. It was a lime tree as great as that which used to grow at Moor Park in Herefordshire, no less that 100 feet in height and 17 feet in girth, a yard above the ground. Its smooth beech-like trunk was embellished with a sort of beard of little twigs at the bottom, and where each of the great branches had sprung from the trunk, the bark had split, and was now discolored with rainwater sap. The bees zoomed among its bright and sticky leaves higher and higher towards heaven, and a rope ladder disappeared among the foliage. Nobody could have climbed that tree without a ladder, even with irons. You think well, Meester K said little John, and there be Meester Robin, a dallying between her roots. The boys who had been more interested in the lookout man perched in a crow's nest at the very top of that swaying and whispering glory of the earth, lowered their eyes at once and clapped them upon Robin Wood. He was not, as they had expected, a romantic man or not at first, nearly as tall as little John these two, of course, were the only people in the world who have ever shot an arrow the distance of a mile, with the English long bow, or at any rate more than six feet high. He was a sinewy fellow whose body did not carry an ounce of fat. He was not half naked, like John, but clad discreetly in faded green with a silvery bugle at his side. He was clean-shaven, sunburnt, nervous, gnarled like the roots of the trees which he loved, but gnarled and mature with weather and with poetry rather than with age, for he was about 30 years old. Eventually he lived to be 87 and attributed his long life to smelling the turpentine in the pines. At the moment he was lying flat on his back and looking upwards, but not into the sky. It had been beautiful to see little leather clad much sitting complacently at his dinner, more beautiful to see the great lens of little John sprawling in company with his dog. But now there was something which was most beautiful of all, for Robin would lay happily with his head in Marion's lap. She sat between the roots of the lime tree, clad in a one-piece smock of green, girded in with a quiver of arrows, and her feet and arms were bare. She had let down the brown shining waterfall of her hair, which was usually kept braided in pigtails for convenience in hunting and cookery, and with the falling waves of this she framed his uplooking head. She was singing a duet with him softly, and tickling the end of his nose with the finest hairs. Nobody nowadays could write the song which they were singing. Under the green wood tree sang Maid Marian, who loves to lie with me, and tune his merry note. Unto the sweet bird's throat, come hither, come hither, come hither, sang Robin, here shall he see. 
no enemy, but winter and rough weather. They laughed happily and began again, singing lines alternately. Who doth ambition shun, and loves to lie i the sun, seeking the food he eats, and pleased with what he gets. Then, both together, come hither, come hither, come hither, here shall he see, no enemy, but winter and rough weather. The song ended in laughter, and Robin, who had been twisting his brown fingers in and out of the silk fine threads which fell about his face, gave them a shrewd tug and scrambled to his feet. Now, John, he said, seeing them at once. Now, Meester said little John, so you've brought the young squires? They brought me, said little John. Welcome whatever way, said Robin. I never heard ill spoken of Sir Ector, nor reason why his sounders should be pursued. How are you, Kay and Wart, and who set you so luckily into the forest at my glades on this day of all days? Robin interrupted Maid Marian at this point reproachfully. You can't mean to take them with you on a venture like this. They are far too young. Why not, my sweetheart? The people are their people, and they would wish to be there. But they are children, and none the worst of that. If they are worth their salt they can move quicker than we can, and hide better, and I'll warrant me, they can shoot well enough with the bow. There is no need that they should come to close quarters at the end made any more than thou. I think it's inhuman said Maid Marian, and began to do up her hair. Can you shoot? asked Robin. Trust me said the wart. I can try said Kay, more reserved, as they laughed at the wart's comical assurance. Come, Marion said Robin, let us have one of thy bows. Maid Marion handed him a bow and half a dozen arrows twenty-eight inches long. Shoot the papinje said Robin, handing them to the wart. Wart now looked and saw the papinje set up full five score paces away. He guessed that he had been a fool and said cheerfully, I'm sorry, Robin Wood, but I'm afraid it is much too far away for me. Never mind, said the outlaw, have a shot at it anyway, I can tell all I want to know by the way you shoot. The wart fitted his arrow as quickly and neatly as he was able, set his feet wide in the same line, as he wished his arrow to go, squared his shoulder, drew the bow to his chin, sighted on the mark, raised his point through an angle of about 20 degrees, aimed two yards to the right, because he always pulled to the left in his loose, and sped his arrow. It missed, but not so badly. Now, Kay said Robin. Kay went through the same motions and also made a pretty good shot. Each of them had held the bow the right way up, had quickly found the cock feather and set it outwards, each had taken hold of the string to draw the bow, most boys who have not been taught are inclined to catch hold of the knock of the arrow when they draw between their finger and thumb, but, of course, a proper archer pulls back the string with his first two or three fingers and lets the arrow follow it. Neither of them had allowed the point to fall away towards the left as they drew, nor struck their left forearms with the bowstring two common faults with people who don't know, and each had loosed evenly without a pluck. Good said Robin, no loot players here. I said little John, it weren't bad for boys, but suppose you show em, Mr. Ood. Is it a match John? Asked Robin smiling. These two men were the oldest of rivals with a bow in England, and could never forbear to take one another on in competition. Go on said Marion, you two are like children. Us hand never fled afore a challenge, Mr. Ood said little John slowly, his eyes twinkling, as thee knows to thy cost. Get on, man, said Robin, you know I could beat you with one hand behind my back. Little John deliberately put the toe of his great bow against the inside of his instep, pulled the grip outward with his mighty right fist and slipped the string into place with his left hand. It was a movement like an absent-minded caress, but probably nobody else except Robin could have strung his bow. Tis for a buffet, meester, he inquired, grinning at Robin with slight challenge. A buffet said the captain of the outlaws, go on and I'll let you off with a light stroke. Little John lumbered himself into position and remarked philosophically, folks say the last laugh rings merriest. 
With this, in a limber flash which had nothing to do with his bear-like movements and slow speech, the fugitive who had once been called Nailer had raised, drawn, loosed and lowered his bow, apparently without aiming it, and the arrow was saying fut, in the heart of the Papinje, before cleaving straight through it and burying its point in the ground. A shaky loose said Robin from two yards behind him, and as little John turned round to smile at his captain, but before he could turn back again towards the Papinje, the captain's arrow also was cutting through the bird of straw. Wart noticed that where he and Kay had been compelled to aim their woman's bow 20 degrees above the mark, Robin and Little John were still loosing well below it, although it was a hundred yards away. The boys had been given Maid Marian's bow to shoot with because they could not have drawn any other. Its straw was a horizontal pull of only 25 or 30 pounds, while Robin and his lieutenant were opening arcs with a force of anything up or above a hundred. If you have ever attempted to lift a hundred weight upwards from the ground with all your stature to help you, you will be able to appreciate the steady force which the two greatest English archers were able to exert, not upwards, but horizontally. Robin said Maid Marian sharply, you are being a baby, you will just go on and on until each of you has had a dozen shots, and then one or the other of you will miss, and the conqueror will claim the right to give him a smack. How can you be so childish? I want to beat John here said Robin would plausibly, because otherwise he will become insubordinate. Insubordinate fiddlesticks, leave your silly competition and send these boys away to their father. That I won't do said Robin unless they wish to go, it is their quarrel as much as it is mine. What is the quarrel? asked Kay. Robin threw down his bow and sat cross-legged on the ground, drawing Maid Marian to sit beside him. His face had suddenly gone grim. It's the anthropophagy he said. The boys looked so blank that he took a breath and began to explain. Perhaps you have never heard of the anthropophagy? I don't blame you. There were none of these bad creatures in our old England until a few years ago, when my lord of Lilford liberated a pair at Oundle. Now they swarm and increase daily. To the menace of true woodmen of the old breed, they live like outlaws in the woods, just as we do. But the arrows they use are poisoned, they are cannibals too. Nobody can stand against them, for our arrows are not mortal unless they strike a mortal blow, while theirs kill horribly, even with a scratch. What sort of arrows are they? They paint them black and yellow, like wasps. They are cunning archers, especially the Nissites from Serpithem, and their murders grow more pestilent every week. It is not that they waylay fat abbots, or occasionally string up an oppressive moneylender or an unjust nobleman, protected by the laws of his class. They are bad, wild creatures. They give nothing to the poor. Only, living in the worst quarters of the forest, they creep out like wolves or adders and assassinate any person that they see. They kill us for the pot. There were wolf Matthew said little John bitterly, struck as he were making huddles. Peter they killed sleeping. Walter fell as he stooped to draw water, and Colin at my side, barked like a dog before he fell on his face. They had a shot at me once said the wart. They make no distinction of man, woman or child. Are you at war with these people? asked Kay. I am sworn to exterminate them said Robin. A silence fell upon the four speakers under the tree. Robin sat with an arrow in his hand and cut moodily at the turf with its point. For four months now said E. My scouts have sought their stronghold. By day and by night, in all weathers, they have rested where the track took them, eaten little, slept less. They have come back to me weary with their reports, and fallen on sleep when they had scarce done speaking. Many have not come back. Last week we traced them to their nest. It must be a surprise attack. They are wasps and must be destroyed like wasps. If we march upon them in daylight or offered them fair battle they would fly. Their troops would melt away before us in the undergrowth only to hang about our wings on the march home and to shoot invisibly using their deadly arrows. It must be an attack from which not one escapes. 
We shall make it in the darkness this evening, because then they will hold a feast. What this feast is concerns you, K in wart, more than it concerns me. Have they caught one of our people? They have caught the dog boy. This morning, when he took the hounds out for their roll in the grass, Cavill chased a rabbit into the edge of the forest. The dog boy called him, but he did not come. He went after him and could see nothing. He turned round at a slight noise and found himself surrounded by cyapodes, one of whom was holding Cavill by the muzzle so that he could not bark. This news came to me from my northward trees, at about the same time that much and little John told me of your approach from the east. We must rescue them. Are they alive? They will keep them alive until the feast begins, for the sake of freshness. They have kept one other alive also, for tonight is to be one of their nights of sacrifice. Who is the other? It is an old man called Watt, a harmless old person who used to live wild in the forest, supporting himself on grass and roots and acorns. He has no nose. That is our man too said the wart. He lived in our village before he lost his wits. Why, it was he who bit off the dog boy's nose. Fancy his living on acorns. We all thought he was a terrible old man who bit off children's noses, a sort of ogre of the forest. Well said Robin, he is a tamed ogre now, poor fellow. What of it, then Mr. K? Asked little John after a long pause. Will he leave thy men to be eaten? Or said Robin, do you come with us? There was no need to reply. 